We are live. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. The committee has just returned from an executive session for the purpose of conducting a strategy session related to collective bargaining with the Boston Teachers Union and our school bus drivers union, United Steelworkers of America, Local 8751. Tonight's session is being shared live on Zoom. It will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the school committee's webpage and on YouTube. For those of you joining us on Zoom or at a later date, you can find tonight's meeting documents posted on the committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org, fun slash school committee, under the September 22nd meeting link. The agenda, presentations, and equity impact statements have been translated in all of the major BPS languages. Any translations that are not ready prior to the start of the meeting will be posted as soon as they are finalized. The committee is pleased to be offering five live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Veriano, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Vietnamese in American Sign Language. After the interpreters introduce themselves and provide Zoom instructions, we will activate the interpretation icon, the globe, at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference. Will our Spanish interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Espanol. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone, distinguished guests. My name is Juan Bernal. I am the Spanish interpreter that is assigned to interpret consecutively for Spanish-speaking school committee member, Ms. Rafaela Polanco Garcia, while the other two simultaneous interpreters will be provide interpretation throughout the meeting simultaneously. I will now proceed to explain how to access the interpretation feature in Spanish. Muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy uno de los intérpretes asignados para la reunión de hoy. Voy a proveer interpretación consecutiva para la miembro de las escuelas públicas del Comité de Boston, Rafaela Polanco García. Mientras los otros dos intérpretes van a proveer interpretación simultánea durante la duración de este evento. Para accesar el icono de la interpretación, busquen el globo que aparece en la parte inferior derecha de sus pantallas y seleccionen español como su idioma de preferencia. De igual manera, aquellas personas que se estén conectando de un teléfono celular, de una tableta o de un iPad, busquen los tres puntos que aparecen en la parte superior de su pantalla y seleccionen donde dice Language Interpretation, español como su idioma de preferencia. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. The next, next interpreter may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, good evening. My name is Luz Barreto, and I will be your simultaneous interpreter in Spanish. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Luz Barreto. Seré su intérprete de español. Por favor, sigan las instrucciones que han dado, que dado Juan para que nos puedan oír en español. Mi compañera Leslie Martínez estará trabajando conmigo para atenderlos toda la noche en el canal de español. De español. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Do we have a third Spanish interpreter? Leslie, no. ¿te quieres presentar? Leslie, sí, me estoy presentando. Yes. Thank you. Hello. My name is Leslie Martinez. I am also the Spanish interpreter for this night in order for everybody to um, have access to the Spanish channel. They follow the instructions so previously given by Juan. Press the glove at the bottom of the screen and choose your uh, preferred language. Muy buenas noches, mi nombre es Leslie Martinez. Yo también soy la intérprete de español para esta noche. Voy a interpretar simultáneamente. Si usted necesita escuchar la interpretación de esta reunión esta noche, por favor presione en la, el globo en la parte baja de la pantalla y escoja su idioma preferido, idioma español en este caso. Gracias. Thank you. Will our Haitian Creole interpreters please introduce yourself and give Zoom instructions in Haitian Creole. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Sergio Centillo, Haitian Creole interpreter. 
C'est un plaisir encore nous gagner aujourd'hui pour nous lancer ça en direct moi même avec Nadej n'a pas capable assurer interprétation pour et que et pas oublier tout ça qu'on t'a gagné pour dire ou à peut adresser ou à regarder en bas écran là ou à venir au globe ou à cliquer et puis ou à capable entrer et en contact avec tout ça qu'a dit nous souhaiter que ou participer dans tout ça qu'a dit sous son gain pour dire ou m'a pas capable traduire pour et puis il a déjà fait même bagaille là m'a peut fini m'a commencé jusqu'à 6h30 m'a fini et puis n'a déjà point à 6h30 là fini à 9h30 et puis moi même m'a tourner encore à 9h30 pour me finir jusqu'à 11h15 ou bien plus tard et nous souhaiter que vous passez un très bon après-midi et nous dit ben bonne écoute merci beaucoup thank you thank bye you. bye good evening um, ladies and gentlemen bonsoir tout le monde non moi c'est Nadej moi c'est un créole interprète comme ça je fais que vous donc n'a pas interprété pour à tour de rôle donc si nous avons question tapez les dans le chat là et moi espérer que nous va porter un bon service pour nous à soin et moi je vous souhaite une bonne écoute merci thank you well cabo variano interpreters please introduce yourselves and give zoom instructions Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josiane, and along with Armando, will be your simultaneous interpreters for this night. Boa noite, boa tarde. Meu nome é Josiane, sabendo ser um dos intérpretes simultâneos para o Nautilus, juntamente com Armando. Para que você tenha acesso à interpretação simultânea, nós clica na ícone de globo na parte inferior do nosso ecrã e seleciona Cabo Verdeano. Se você está usando o telemóvel, nós clica na três pontinhos e nós fazemos o mesmo processo. Logo, o ícone fica disponível. Obrigada. Armando, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Armando Montero. I'm going to be your simultaneous uh, interpreter together with Josiane. Um, for everybody who wants to join us, you can go in your right bottom and go to the globe, and you can choose and access your language. Boa noite a toda a gang. Ami é Armando Montero. Ami interpreter de criolo Cabo Verdeano, juntamente com Josiane. Uh, Para tudo quem é que crê acessa is meeting is reunion no body by na lado direito de baixo no to acessa globe e muta scoji bulingua boa noite obrigado thank you thank you well our cantonese interpreters yeah. please introduce oh, yeah. yourselves and give zoom instructions in cantonese Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna. I'll be a Cantonese interpreter for the meeting tonight. Um, Thank you, Anna. Cantonese interpreters. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Well, our Mandarin interpreters, please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Mandarin. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Wei. And Tina and I will be your Mandarin simultaneous interpreters tonight. Hey, 大家好, 我是普通话翻译委, 如果你需要普通话翻译的话呢, 请你点击屏幕下方的地球仪, 然后选择中文, uh, Mandarin频道, 然后就可以进入这个频道听闻翻译, 如果您使用的是手机或者平板电脑, 请你点击三个点, 然后选择更多, 啊, 然后也可以听到我们的翻译, OK, uh, Tina? 大家好,我是您今天晚上的普通话翻译,我和李伟会三十分钟一换或者一个小时一换,那好,祝您今天晚上一块一块见到。Thank uh, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Will our Vietnamese interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Vietnamese? Uh, good evening, everyone. Tôi tên là Duyên Triệu, tôi là thông dịch người Việt Nam hôm nay. Nếu mà anh chị có cần uh, ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt, xin bấm vào quả cầu và chọn tiếng Việt ạ. À. Uh, xin chào các anh chị và 
Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is V. Um, I will be the Vietnamese interpreter um, for tonight's meeting. Kính chào quý vị, tôi tên là Vi, tôi sẽ là thông dịch viên thứ hai, um, là thông dịch viên người Việt của quý vị vào buổi tối ngày hôm nay. Xin quý vị vào nhìn vào màn hình và bấm vào quả cầu để có thể nghe được thông dịch viên um, dịch lại. Uh, chị Duyên và tôi sẽ dịch lại cho quý vị. Cảm ơn rất nhiều. Thank you. Thank you. And will our American Sign Language Interpretation interpreters please introduce yourselves? Hello, I'm Sharon. I'm also going to be teamed with Julia and Crystal. The three of us will be in the main room. No need to touch the language um, icon. Right now, we're fine and we're happy to serve. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Thank you all for assisting this evening. And thank you to all of the BPS staff behind the scenes who will also provide support for our virtual meetings to run smoothly. We will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Thank you to everyone who signed up for public comment. Sign up for both public comment periods closed today at 4.30 p.m. Please make sure you are signed into Zoom under the same name you used to sign up for public comment. You can use the Zoom tools to rename yourself so that committee staff will be able to recognize you when it comes time to call on you. Thank you for your cooperation. We'll now move on to the approval of minutes from the September 1st, 2021 school committee meeting. At this time, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the September 1st 2021 school committee meeting as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rujo? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The minutes are approved unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We'll now move on to the superintendent's report. I present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenda Caselius. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for joining us this evening for our first school committee meeting of the 21-22 school year. First, I want to acknowledge the current Haitian refugee crisis at the U.S. border. I know many of our students, staff, and families have immigrated from Haiti or have family and friends who live there currently. Our Haitian students represent one of the largest ethnic populations in the district, and BPS stands with our Haitian people during this truly difficult period for our nation. I've heard from staff and other community members who are anxious about loved ones because of the crisis created by the most recent disasters and the political instability in the country, exacerbating concerns that have been compounded by the poor treatment of Haitian refugees in Texas. We continue to keep the people of Haiti here and abroad in our thoughts and support is available for anyone within our BPS community who needs it. I'd like to focus my report tonight, and it's a, it's a long one, <laughs> uh, on various data points from the first couple of weeks of the school year. I'm gonna start with attendance. We're very pleased to report our highest first day attendance rate on record for the first day of school. Thursday, September 9th. Our attendance rate has continued to improve as the school year has progressed, reaching a high of 88% on Friday, September 17th. As you can see here, we have averaged 86% attendance and are seeing a bit lower attendance in the upper grades. 
We mentioned to the school, school committee in recent weeks that our enrollment generally stabilizes once we remove the students who did not report or otherwise known as DNR. BPS plans to withdraw approximately 1,500 students marked as DNR from our rosters by the end of this week. We will report our 21-22 school year enrollment to DESE on October 1st, after which we will have even better understanding of our attendance. We've had over 900 students register since the September 1st, and our welcome services team continues to support families with registration online, by phone, and in person at our four welcome centers. Following two school years impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, it's wonderful to see such strong attendance and to have all of our students back in their classrooms learning in person with their caring and loving teachers. I know that in Boston and across the Commonwealth, some parents have advocated for a remote learning option for their students. I want to reiterate that the state has mandated full in-person learning for our students. During our last meeting, Deputy Superintendent of Academics, Drew Eccleson, outlined the process for home and hospital instruction. So far, 20 students have been approved for traditional home and hospital services. 23 students have requested the modified home and hospital services available this year. The district has approved 19 of these requests, three are pending approval, and one was not approved because the student's physician did not view the accommodation as necessary. We have also approved 267 applications for homeschooling this year, which is higher than in previous years. While we continue to explore a virtual school option for the future and are providing the home and hospital option to students who meet that criteria, we know that the best learning environment for our students is inside the classroom. I'm gonna give a little update on transportation. During our last meeting, we alerted the school committee that Boston was experiencing challenges similar to other districts across the Commonwealth and the country due to the national bus driver shortage. Here you will see our average bus on time performance and hot time wait, hotline wait times from school years 2014 to 2020. In the middle column, you'll see the numbers for those metrics last year during disrupted in-person learning when many of our students were learning remotely. And on the right, the numbers for this school year thus far. It's important to note that Boston Public Schools transports approximately 24,000 students every day to 232 different schools, BPS and non-BPS schools. We provide door-to-door -door transportation to 5,989 students. BPS transports all bus eligible students who are Boston residents to our schools, as well as charter, parochial, and private schools. BPS also transports students in the care of the Department of Children's and Families to their school buildings, as well as Boston students to non-BPS schools located outside of Boston, including Worcester, New Hampshire, and Cape Cod. We have 700 buses in our fleet, and operate 641 daily. I wanna thank our 641 drivers and monitors who show up every day and get our kids safely to school. So far this year, the on-time transportation of students in Boston has surpassed the average over the past five years. Not counting last year's hybrid learning, which only saw roughly half of our students attending school in person, on the first day of school, 57% of buses were on time and that percentage increased to 81% the second Friday, September 10th. A bus considered on time arrives before the school bell time. BPS also tracks the number of buses that arrive within 15 minutes of the bell time and those that arrive within 30 minutes of the bell time. The table here shows the on-time performance as well as the, the time within 15 minutes and within 30 minutes performance of buses during the first five days of the year. As you can see from the table, 96% of students arrive at school within 15 minutes of school start time and 99% arrive within 30 minutes. While our goal is always 100%, 
These numbers represent a significant improvement over past year's performance. Last week, during the full week of the school year, BPS transportation averaged 82% on-time performance, with our highest performing day last week peaking on Friday, September 17th, at 90% on-time rate for morning trips. Although it is not on the slide, so far this week, 90% of buses have arrived on time each day. Our transportation call center has provided real-time support to families from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily with over 7,200 calls handled since the start of school. As a reminder, the hotline number is 617-635-9520. Families can also track their child's bus using the Where's My School Bus app, available at https colon forward slash forward slash schoolbus.bostonpublicschools.org. BPS currently has 664 active bus drivers and 105 standby or reserve drivers. Transdev has hired 46 new drivers since July. Six drivers are currently completing training and we are processing an additional 16 drivers to join the team. We continue to process opt-outs and consolidate routes where possible in order to minimize the impact of driver and monitor shortages. Earlier this month, Governor Baker called on the National Guard to support local districts across the Commonwealth with transportation of students to school due to the bus driver shortage. Our understanding is that the National Guard members had to possess a 7D license, which qualified them to operate vans that hold a limited number of students. BPS does not currently have vans in our fleet that these members would be qualified to drive, meaning we would have to lease these vehicles and add additional cost to the district and on a short time frame. In addition, the National Guard drivers are not fully trained to serve our student population, including many of our students who have disabilities. We were also told that the assistance of the National Guard members would be short term, posing potential disruption when the temporary assistance ended. The city would also have had to impact bargain with the driver's union, which typically takes several weeks. After, carefully, after careful review, the current, after carefully reviewing the current complement of backup bus drivers, our projections for continued improvement in on-time performance, as well as relatively short period of time that National Guard members would be available to support transportation efforts, BPS declined the offer of assistance. We still remain focused on the long-term solutions, and tonight I am announcing a superintendent's working group. Several of you have asked me to address our deep challenges and share more broadly the recommendations from our transportation consultant with our public to resolve the long-standing systemic and contractual issues plaguing our bus operations. Some of those deeper issues include our walk zones, student assignment system, charter transportation, start times, tiered routing, monitor and bus driver contracts, and communications to families. I am doing this because I believe it will take political will and public support to make these necessary long, long standing changes. I want to acknowledge and commend the transportation team and in particular, Ms. Stanislaus on their continued work to improve. They have worked hard over the past year with our TransDev partner to implement every op operational improvement they can from the report. What is needed are the harder changes, the changes that will be necessary to improve the whole system. And it's time that the public understands the deeper complexities of our transportation system and the reasons behind the yearly snarls of getting kids to school on time. I will provide you with an update on the working group members, the charge, and the structure of the working group on October 6th. I'm gonna share a little bit now about um, our dashboard and our testing, uh, COVID testing. This year, BPS is building upon last year's efforts to ensure our health and safety protocols are in place. We're focusing on four mitigation strategies. 
consistent and correct mask wearing, expanding access to vaccines and promoting their safety, frequent COVID-19 testing, and improving ventilation and regularly assessing our air quality. In addition to weekly pool testing, we are also providing testing for students experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. Any student who complains of any of the symptoms of COVID-19 will visit the nurse and have access to a rapid test. And decisions on the next steps are based on the results of the test. Also, new this year is the test and stay program introduced by our partners at DESI, which allows individuals who are identified as close contact of confirmed positive case to stay in school with daily testing for five days if they do not have symptoms. So far, over 18,000 families have provided consent for their students to participate in weekly pool testing. As we did last year, BPS is reporting positive cases among students and staff to DESI and we are posting those updates to a dashboard on the BPS website. DESI posts updates on Thursdays for the week prior, spanning Thursday to Wednesday. The BPS dashboard reflects reporting for the same period. Multiple cases in one school do not necessarily indicate that the cases are related. BPS and public health officials communicate individually with each student or staff member who is confirmed positive or confirmed as a close contact. All districts started their reporting last week for the period encompassing September 13th through the 15th. We just provided our report for this week for the period encompassing September 16th to the 22nd. The dashboard will be updated tomorrow, but here you can see a preview of the updated numbers. This week, we have 32 positive cases among students and 20 among staff. This brings us to 46 cases year to date for students and 28 cases year to date for staff. BPS remains committed to transparently reporting this weekly update and notifying all school communities and administrative offices when there is a positive case reported in the building. The dashboard is available at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash COVID dashboard. We continue to work with the state on their protocols and testing contract with CIC Health. There have been some delays and we are working through these issues for a smooth administration. I wanna thank our health services and data and accountability teams, as well as the Boston Health Commission for their continued collaboration on our health and safety protocols. As you know, yesterday, DESE released its annual state assessment results for schools and districts statewide, which underscore the district's continued effort to close opportunity and achievement gaps for students and address the effects of the global pandemic on student learning. The data shows declines in student performance, affirming what we know, that the pandemic did impact student learning and that our academic acceleration initiatives are necessary to continue closing the gaps that have exacerbated the challenges of the past 18 months. However, declines for our district were generally less severe than the state's, state's average declines. The large urban districts in Massachusetts had comparable grade three through eight scores in 2019. However, Boston experienced smaller decreases in ELA and math, English language arts and math, in terms of the percentages of students who met and exceeded expectations on the assessment. Here you will see results from the 2020 administration of the MCAS for BPS students. Several changes were made to MCAS administration for 2021. In grades three through eight, students took only one session of the MCAS and students were allowed to take the test in person or remotely. 91% of BPS students in grades three through eight took the MCAS in English language arts and math with participation by grade level ranging from 87% to 94%. In grade 10, 70% of students took the ELA MCAS and 68% of students took the math MCAS. 
Here you will see the four performance levels of 2021 ELA MCAS. The line on the bar represents the percentage of students meeting or exceeding expectations from 2019. 31% of tested students met or exceeded expectations in grades three through eight in ELA, a decrease of four percentage points from 2019, which is less than the statewide decline of six percentage points. For students who participated in 10th grade MCAS, ELA results were consistent with pre-pandemic performance. This slide shows the same graph for 2021 math MCAS results. 20% of tested students met or, expect, or exceeded expectations in grades three through eight in math, a decrease of 13 percentage points from 2019, which is less than the statewide decline of 16 percentage points. For 10th grade students, the math performance also declined from 2019. We have invested in the social emotional health and well being of our students by deploying a full time nurse, social worker, and family liaison in every school, and expanded the hub school model to provide access to wraparound service for students and families in 14 schools. Last school year, we launched new data tools, including Panorama Student Success, which enables school based and district staff to access real time actionable and holistic student data, work together to log support notes and design and monitor individual student success plans. And starting this school year, BPS will contract with an online vendor that provides 24 seven tutoring support aligned with BPS curriculum and instruction. And we are also renewing our commitment to equitable literacy by providing access to new materials and professional development for school leaders and school based staff. We will provide a full analysis of the MCAS results to the full committee during our next meeting on October 6. As mentioned earlier, ventilation and air quality remain a key focus in our buildings. Our facilities team continues to install indoor air quality sensors in classrooms across the district. To date, more than 3,000 sensors have been installed across 88 schools. This project is on track for completion by the end of October. Bids have been returned for the installation of our air conditioning units across the district, and we are moving forward with the contract process. We are on track for installation of units to begin in October. The district has also procured pop-up tents, 10 feet by 10 feet, through WD Mason. Each school that has opted, to, opted in will receive five tents. Parameters and use on, on use and storage have been provided to schools to ensure they are in compliance. School leaders continue to request additional air purifiers and fans as needed and turnaround for delivery of these units is 24 hours after the request approval. The system for PPE delivery request is live and deliveries of confirmed requests occur weekly. There have been some delays from our new bottled water vendor. We have been working with the team and today I can report all schools have their stock of water and we have 100 bottles in reserve. We have operational improvements we are making with the team to identify shortages, and this should ensure schools are fully stocked with plenty of water. As a reminder, this year we are beginning our first phase of our $16 million investment in clean, potable, refillable stations in every BPS school. And this will eventually eliminate the need to truck in bottled water. I want to provide an update on another important part of our operations, food and nutrition services. Here you will see some of the delicious meals being served to our students by our food and nutrition service team. FNS has a produce supplier for fresh foods, fruits, and vegetables and is delivering directly to our warehouse. FNS is also working with a new grocer that has started delivering to five of our largest schools relieving some of the stress at our distribution warehouse. My Way Cafe projects are moving forward at 17 sites with new construction scheduled 
largely after school hours from 2.30 to 11 p.m. We are working with individual schools if day work is possible to progress and will soon schedule delivery of new equipment. The vacancy rate, unfortunately, is still very high at 22%, but the team is scheduling interviews weekly and prioritizing hiring of serve safe certified staff. We continue to plan with our City of Boston colleagues regarding meals plans for quarantine students and are also experiencing expecting an updated plan of PEBT distribution. Last meeting, uh, you asked me for a hiring update. During our, during our last meeting, I informed members of our hiring needs and I wanna provide just a quick update as to where we are in the process for hiring some key positions. Overall, we're at about 90% of teacher vacancies hired, submitted for this year compared to 95% at this point last year. This is due to the higher than usual volume of resignations and retirements and newly posted positions created from ESSER funding. For context, there have been 51 new teacher vacancies posted since the start of September, compared to 29 vacancies posted in the same time frame last year. An increase in September postings of 76% over last year. Of all educator hires this year, including teachers and guidance counselors, 34% identify as Black African American versus the 31% last year, 16% identify as Latinx, comparably with 16% last year, 7% 7, 7 identify as Asian versus 6% last year. Of external educator hires this year, 26% identify as Black African American versus 23.5% last year, 17% identify as Latinx versus 15% last year, 11% identify as Asian versus 9.8% last year. Nearly 47% of hires this year identify as speaking one or more of BPS official languages other than English. The vacancy targets seen here for hourly roles, transportation, food, and nutrition services, and custodial staff are estimates. These roles are pool positions, so not individually posted jobs. We've done our best to estimate hires needed in consultation with these departments. It has been a struggle to find people to fill hourly roles in general this year, as there are some of the lowest paid roles in the district. OHC has been working to support these departments and connecting them with co colleagues in the retention, cultivation, and diversity departments. And we continue to process hires as they come through, making as many accommodations as possible to streamline the welcome sessions and processing of paperwork to move candidates through quickly. For our custodial staff, the remaining vacancies are part-time. Our fantastic custodial team feel like they are in good shape in terms of full-time positions, but are always hiring for part-time roles. They would love to have another 10 to 15 part-time folks hired. In other news from yesterday, Winship Elementary School in Brighton was one of five schools in Massachusetts named as a National Blue Ribbon School. Schools are recognized each year for their overall academic performance or progress in closing achievement gaps among student groups. The Winship is one of 325 schools recognized across the country this year for their achievement. Congratulations to Principal Brian Radley and the amazing staff and students at the Winship on this well-deserved honor. We'll be by soon for a visit and congratulatory um, fun um, to honor your success. BPS is proud to recognize the achievements and contributions of Hispanic American and Latinx champions who have inspired others to achieve success. To all the Latinx members of our community, we see you, we celebrate you, and we lift you up, and we lift all of your heritage and culture that bring that and wonderful culture that you bring to the Boston community. The Division of Academics has curated resources for our educators to guide classroom discussions, and the Office of English Language Learners is hosting events to celebrate the vibrant contributions of the Latinx community. The first event 
Conversations con Salsa, Patria y Cultura with Salsa, Homeland and Culture will be moderated by Jose Maso. This virtual event will be held on Wednesday, September 29th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. in both English and Spanish, and will focus on racialization in Puerto Rico through music. The second event, Women in Salsa, will also be moderated by Jose Massa with special guest Sita Rodriguez. The conversation will touch on the legacy of three legendary and iconic Cuban singers, Celia Cruz, Graciela, and La Lupe, and their influence on the singing career of Sita Rodriguez. The virtual event will also, be, will also include discussion of the role of bilingual education in the classroom. This event will be on Wednesday, October 6th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. OEL is celebrating Latinx and Hispanic heritage all year long, and details on these events and future events are available on the district calendar at Boston Public Schools dot org forward slash calendar. In early August, BPS notified the Mission Hill K-8 school community that the co-teacher leaders had been removed from their positions and placed on administrative leave pending further investigation into their role in misconduct at the school. This decision was made following an investigation that found credible evidence that the school did not take appropriate action after complaints were filed about the mistreatment of at least one student between 2014 and 2019. Due to the sensitive nature of the investigation's finding and additional allegations that have been brought forward, BPS is not providing additional details at this time to protect the identities of students and families involved. Two additional teachers were placed on paid leave, paid administrative leave as a result of separate allegations. The physical, social, and emotional health of our students is the top priority of the Boston Public Schools. Once the findings of the months long investigation were shared with me, I felt it was necessary to take swift action to foster a safe and respectful teaching and learning environment. The evidence was credible and substantial and included reports dating back at least five years. The findings also uncovered many more concerns that warrant a deeper look. I have directed additional training, support and resources for members of the school community to ensure a safe, culturally affirming and welcoming learning environment for all Mission Hill K-8 students. I'm grateful for Margarita Muniz Academy Head of School, Dania Vasquez, who has stepped in to lead the Mission Hill K-8 pilot school temporarily and assist in opening school through the end of September. We aim to name an interim leader by early next week. Dr. Vasquez has worked tirely, tirelessly on daily operations as well as setting up expectations. Recently retired Hale School Principal Romaine Teak Mills has also temporarily, temporarily returned to BPS to support the Mission Hill community during this time of transition through classroom observation and interacting with staff and students. We've held two meetings with the Mission Hill community and Dr. Wei is meeting with the governance board chair on a weekly basis. Dr. Grace Wei, the elementary school superintendent and assistant superintendent Dacia Campbell have been working to identify an interim principal and continue to support and monitor the school and ensure a safe and respectful school climate. Mission Hill is one of 32 transformation schools that is in its third year of targeted support to include adoption of district curriculum, instructional implementation, and assessment literacy. Mission Hill is also one of the original BPS pilot schools, which allows certain autonomies. However, the investigation points to years of academic decline, as well as apparent disregard for district and state mandates regarding management and governance. The school has had district support over the years, including Succeed Boston, as well as the Office of Equity, though these practices were inadequately implemented. As a result, the district has provided training in bullying prevention intervention from Succeed Boston on discipline, of students and disabilities with disabilities on DESE policy requirements for de-escalation physical restraint and responding to records requests. We will also hold upcoming trainings on the code of conduct, 
and from the Office of Equity on addressing bias-based incidents. The district office is deploying an inclusion specialist to fill, ensure, to fill and ensure, and the assistant director for special education is reviewing all IEPs to ensure student needs are being met. As a result of the administrative leaves and other leaves, the school is looking to fill several positions. Dr. Wei has called and emailed 55 candidates from the recruitment office and searched for applicants who have applied to substitute in the district. If you know any qualified candidates or teachers or paraprofessionals or daily substitutes, we'd be glad to know those. I know that Mission Hill parents and caregivers are here tonight to express their concerns about changes in leadership and staffing that has impacted their children's experience. I understand this change is difficult for some families to understand, but the team and I at BPS continue to pursue the best interests of our students, staff, and overall community. We look forward to announcing the new school leader in the coming days, and the school community has our full support at BPS, and we will continue working toward a successful school year. I want to shift to an exam school implementation brief update, which we will update you more fully on October 6th. Now that all of our schools are open and the school year is full swing, we have begun the process of implementing the exam school policy that was passed this summer. My team is working diligently on the assessments and on grading processes, and, on, and I look forward to bringing an updated presentation at our next meeting on October 6th. Now we have the pleasure of introducing to the committee our new school leaders for the 21-22 school year. This slide shows some stats about our school leaders this year. We have 15 first time BPS school leaders this year. Of the 15 new school leaders, 12 are internal hires and seven are fluent in a language other than English. 87% of the new principals and heads of schools are leaders of color and 80% have prior experience working in BPS schools or in an, in an administrative role. In addition, two are BPS graduates. On the far left bar, you will see the race ethnicity breakdown for all of our school leaders. In the middle, you'll see the breakdown for the new school leaders. And on the right, you'll see the race and ethnicity breakdown of our existing school leaders. Our chief of schools, Corey Harris, is here tonight to tell you a bit more about these amazing educators. And now I'll turn things over to Corey. Thanks, uh, Dr. Caselius, to school committee chair Robinson, members of the school committee, and to the listening public. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you a very diverse, as Dr. Caselius just shared, both racially, ethnically, and linguistically uh, slate of very talented school leaders. Uh, before I introduce school leaders, I just want to uh, publicly thank Megan Reed and Monica Hall, uh, who lead the efforts to recruit um, and support the hiring um, of this talented slate of leaders. And I'd also like to thank our school superintendents and our human capital team, uh, who are also critical uh, to our effort uh, to hire talent that represents the racial, ethnic, and ling linguistic diversity of our student population. Well, let's see. All right, first person I'd like to introduce and please turn on your camera as I call your name is Raquel Martinez. She is the proud uh, interim principal at the Snowden International School. Uh, she speaks both English and Spanish. Uh, she was an ELA teacher for over 10 years in both in, in public schools, private schools, charter schools, and even international schools. And she's taught at the middle school, high school, and collegiate level. Uh, so she brings a wide uh, breadth of experience uh, working with young people. Uh, she's very committed to supporting educators uh, to deliver grade level content uh, to our students. We uh, are super excited to have Rachel leading the Snowden International School. 
The next leader that I'd like to introduce uh, is none other than Candace Whitmore. Uh, Candace is the proud principal of the Nathan Hale Elementary School. She comes to us from the Watertown School District uh, where she participated on the district's equity team uh, and she launched some creative initiatives such as the Parents of Color Advisory Council and the uh, Parent Diversity Council. Candace um, is a talented instructional leader. She places students at the center. Uh, she believes in applying her expertise in culturally relevant curriculum design. And she believes that all children can achieve. And on a side note, after Candace was hired, she informed me that I taught her brother uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, 11th grade English. So really small world. Uh, welcome, Candace. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sidney L. Brown. He is the proud head of school at Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. Uh, Dr. Brown is a former professor. He also worked with budding school, budding student, uh, budding school leaders through the instructional leadership program at uh, Alabama State University and Auburn University. Dr. Brown has served on the editorial board of the American Association of School Superintendents. And he's also served on several um, other boards. We're super excited to have Dr. Sidney Brown uh, at the helm of the Madison Park. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Marvin Gutierrez. He's the proud principal of the Timothy Middle School. Uh, he is bilingual, speech, speak, speaks both English and Spanish, and he is an actual graduate, graduate of the John D. O'Brien um, exam school. He was a math department chair at his previous school, and he's done lots of work uh, to develop curriculum. And he completed the Commonwealth Leadership Academy. And on a side note, he has a brand new baby at home. I don't even think quite a month old yet. So uh, let's definitely keep him lifted up as he uh, leads a middle school and uh, also uh, welcomes a brand new baby um, into his family. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Gavin Smith. Gavin is the proud principal of Boston Latin Academy, the proud head of school of Boston Latin Academy. He brings over 10 years of experience as a school leader. Uh, he most recently was the assistant principal at Fenway High School, and he completed a principal fellowship at Boston Latin School. So he's gotten some good uh, training uh, to become a, a very a successful and effective head of school. He's also a board member of uh, several nonprofit uh, organizations. He has served as a principal, as a Lynch uh, principal fellow. Uh, he was a member of the instructional leadership team uh, at his schools, and he also participated on the DESE principal advisory committee. Again, we're super excited to have Gavin at the helm of the Boston Latin Academy. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Sony Felix. She is the proud head of school for Community Academy. Uh, she is bilingual, speaking both English and Haitian Creole. She is originally from Haiti and brings several years of experience to the BPS community. Uh, she recently served as the interim director of the Diploma Plus program at Charlestown High School. And Sony is all about leveling the playing field and making sure that all of our students are served well and ready to transition into adulthood. The next school leader I'd like to introduce is Michelle Simon. She is the proud principal of the GRU Elementary. She completed her principal fellowship at the Josiah Quincy Lower Campus last school year, and she focused on addressing issues of access and equity with a focus on Black and Latinx students and families. She's a lifelong resident of Boston. She attended BPS schools. She has 12 years of experience and eight of those, eight of those years of experience are in Boston public schools. She has led grade level teams and provided uh, professional development and culturally linguistically sustaining practices. She also completed the Lynch Leadership Academy program that's housed at the Boston School of Education. 
We're super excited to have Michelle at the helm of the Groove Elementary School. Next, I'd like to introduce Andrea Johnston. She's the proud head of school for the newly merged BCLA McCormick 7 through 12 pilot school. She has facilitated learning in the area of social justice and mathematics uh, for many BPS educators. She has over 17 years of experience in education, and she most recently served as the assistant principal at the Timothy Middle School. She uh, recently completed the Women Educators of Color WEOC uh, program. Uh, she was in cohort four, and uh, we're currently recruiting for WEOC. And so Andrea is a, is a great example um, of the uh, outcomes that can, that can result from participating in such a program. Uh, she is currently working to support BPS educators to complete the POWs process, uh, which is a part of securing their uh, school leader licensure. Super excited to have Andrea at the helm of the BCLA McCormick, and she's actually leading across two buildings right now. So uh, we really appreciate her for that. Next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Hai Sun. He is the proud principal of the Mather Elementary School. He is bilingual, speaking both English and Vietnamese. He is a BPS product. He graduated from the uh, used to be Holland Elementary School. And he also graduated from Boston Latin School. He has over 10 years of experience um, in leadership roles. He was an academy leader at the Frederick Pilot Middle School. And most recently, he served as the assistant principal at the Frederick Pilot Middle School and also had experience as an assistant principal at the McCormick Middle School. We're super excited to have him at the helm of the Mather Elementary School. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Lauren Murdoch. She's the proud interim principal of the Orchard Gardens K-8 Pilot School. She was previously the elementary school uh, director of instruction uh, at the Orchard Gardens and served as one of the assistant principals uh, last school year at the Orchard Gardens. She is uh, a recent graduate of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She has deep experience as an instructional leader. She's uh, a literacy enthusiast and she's all about student advocacy. The Orchard Gardens is in great hands with Lauren Murdoch at the helm. Next, I'd like to introduce Daniel McCoy. He's the proud interim principal of the Kenny Elementary School. He too is a BPS graduate. He started working in BPS in 2013 as an eighth grade math teacher. He also completed the Lynch Leadership Fellow Program uh, housed at Boston College School of Education. He completed his principal internship or residency at the Mather last school year. Um, and he believes that all students deserve to receive an education that's going to thoroughly prepare them for future success, both uh, socially, emotionally, um, and academically and financially. Uh, he has led professional development around anti-racist practices and is all about welcoming and affirming learning environments, especially for uh, Black and Latinx students. And he too, uh, has recently welcomed a new baby uh, to his family. So he has his uh, hands full uh, as a new school leader uh, and a very, uh, and a young, uh, a new baby um, in the household. Next, I'd like to introduce Emma Fialka Feldman. She's the proud principal of the Roger Clapp Elementary. Uh, Emma is all about inclusivity uh, she has mentored aspiring teachers through the Boston Teacher Residency Program. She has uh, uh, led the design of curriculum in both literacy and math. She served as the interim principal at the Roger Clapp uh, at the second half of last school year, while she was also completing the Lynch Leadership Academy Program housed at Boston College. Uh, again, she's all about inclusion, social justice, equity, and she has written and presented nationally um, about the importance of um, an inclusive education. The Roger Clapp is in great hands with Emma at the helm. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michelle Eason-Smith. 
She is the proud head of school at the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Uh, she is bilingual. Um, she is uh, obviously very fluent in American Sign Language. And she's actually the first deaf head of school in the 152 year history um, of the Horace Mann School. She has five years um, of experience to live in, uh, in an educational leadership role, leading academic departments um, and staff. She was previously the secondary program director, the social work coordinator, uh, and a psychologist at the Horace Mann School. She is a licensed psychologist, and she has over 15 years of experience. We're super excited uh, to have Dr. Uh, Ison Smith leading the Horace Mann School for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Natasha Hafkeny. She is the proud interim principal of the Tobin K-8. Uh, she is bilingual, speaking both English and Spanish. She has worked in the Boston Public Schools for 18 years, and she has had several leadership roles uh, during her 18-year tenure. Uh, she's all about diversity and inclusion and literacy um, and really strong, uh, culturally affirming classroom management. Uh, she believes in strong lesson planning, social justice, uh, diversity and equity and inclusion. She most recently served as the director of instruction and as the interim principal for, for a period of time uh, at the Lee K-8 last year. And she's all about um, helping people develop an anti-deficit view for our most marginalized uh, students. Super excited to have Dr. Hafkeny at the helm at the Tobin. And last but not least, among our uh, 15 very talented school leaders is Alexandre Cherry. He is the proud interim principal at the Lee Pilot at the Lee Academy Pilot School. He's bilingual, speaking both English and Haitian Creole. He served as a co-teacher leader. He's participated uh, on the instructional leadership team at the various schools that he's worked at. And he's also participated in his school site council. He most, he too, uh, recently completed the Lynch Leadership uh, Fellow Program, uh, where he uh, completed his fellowship at the Phineas Bates Elementary School with Rodolfo Morales. Uh, so again, uh, I think this slate of very talented school leaders speaks volumes about our commitment to racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity. Um, and the, the future of Boston Public Schools looks uh, exceptionally bright uh, with these new young leaders and the uh, other talented school leaders that we have at the helm of our schools. And with that, I will turn it back to our superintendent. Hey, uh, Mr. Harris, wonder if you might put up the picture of Michelle. We, I think we might have missed that. Um, and I just want to be able to show her picture. Ooh. There she is. Yes. Okay. Um, I think we had just uh, that didn't advance right. And I think you might have thought it would have it advanced, but it didn't. So we just get a great look at her beautiful face <laughs> so and introduce her. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Harris, and uh, thank the committee. Uh, that's my superintendent report. Thank you very much, superintendent, and I want to give a warm welcome to our new school leaders. Thank you all for taking this critical work. I will now open it up to questions and discussions from the committee. I'd like to remind my colleagues about our agreed upon norm that we each take five minutes. That's one to two questions. And I'd like to remind the BPS staff to also be brief in your response. If you have additional questions, I'll come back and do a second round. If you have a question, please raise your virtual hand or put the request in the chat. Thank you. I'll start with Ms. Mercer. Afternoon, everyone. Sorry for being late. So um, my first question is about, is there any updates on EMK? So how are their classes going? Is there enough space for the students, especially given that we're still in the middle of a pandemic? Uh, Mr. DePina, are you on? I know that you went out there and visited. 
Sure, yes. Uh, we went over to the school a couple of times uh, since the beginning of school and uh, worked with um, Dr. Walker Gregory and her team to make sure they were able to do some creative scheduling and rotated classrooms around, classrooms are set up. They're still working um, on getting settled into the building, but for the most part, they're up, they're running, and we're working as best possible to make the building work. Um, we'll be having continued conversations around next steps, but for now, they're doing, they're doing as best possible under the circumstances. Thank you. Um, so my, it's more of a, it's like a question slash comment. Um, so does VPS know that a few schools, including mine, do not have access to Wi-Fi all day today? And uh, is there going to be any next steps about the access of Wi-Fi to these schools? It doesn't need to be answered now. It could be answered also later in the um, email, but I just wanted to let that, you know. Yes, our team has been working around the clock. I know, is Mr. Uh, Racine on the call? Um, yeah. Mr. Could you share just about what happened last night with the, the, sure, cut, the cut cable and what he's been doing uh, with his team to resolve the issue all evening and today? Yeah, there was some construction issues where some wires were cut that impacted about 30 of our schools last night. We were able to get down to about a dozen or so this morning. And we'll continue to work through those and uh, put those back online. So uh, Mr. Racine and his team is aware of the problem um, and have been making some progress along the way. So. Unfortunately, that was a circumstance out of our control, and we had to work um, um, as expeditiously and digital and um, quickly as possible to get it resolved. And we were working on it since yesterday evening around the clock um, till the, through this morning. So um, hopefully everything's back online, and uh, Mr. Racine can give more of an update later on. Thank you. And then um, my next question is about around the ACs. So um, will these so how will these ACs be installed when some schools, including mine, do have bars or some kind of wires on top of the windows in some or most of the um, class, sorry, some or most of the windows? Sure, so um, when we're talking about bringing um, contractors in to install them, those are the type of things that we have to assess and navigate around. So not to oversimplify it, but we'd have to remove any obstacles out of the way and then figure out the best way to secure them into the windows. Uh, so we will have a plan for that, but not to oversimplify, but we'll just move anything out that's in the way and make the installation. And then also along with the bars or wires in the windows, will all the bars or wires in all the schools be taken down because it could be a safety issue if a fire does break out? We can, we can continue to talk about that um, because those some of those bars are up for safety reasons and concerns. So we'd have to be real careful on what we remove and what we um, keep in place. But happy to have further conversations offline about it. And then one last question about the ACs is, um, so the winter time, you know, Boston, it snows a lot and gets really cold. So will these ACs be able to be removed during the winter to stop the cold from coming in or what's gonna happen around that? Um, that's going to be part of the conversations we have with the installers. Um, so I don't have a, a definitive answer yet, but um, my assumption is that we'll make um, some modifications to windows so that they can remain in place. But we'll confirm that once we have more conversations with the um, with the vendors. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mr. De Arujo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with respect to busing, um, a few a few issues on that. Um, one is, is, is what, what is our role as school committee uh, as one of the stakeholders uh, on this issue? Uh, I've been reflecting on, uh, on that uh, the past few weeks, um, heard from many of the families for whom uh, the first, uh, the lead up in particular to the first week of school uh, was a fiasco, uh, anxiety ridden, trying to create all these multiple plans if, if they weren't going to get um, transportation to school. I'm happy to see that the, at least the mornings have improved. Um, but still hearing from families and, you know, uh, I can obviously hear a subset of the thousands that are served, uh, that are having the difficulties and challenges uh, in the afternoon, afternoons. Um, I think as a superintendent um, has noted, uh, you know, there are multiple stakeholders uh, that work to, that have to work together, some don't, uh, to uh, ensure that uh, this, the, the students in Boston, the kids in Boston uh, can get to their programs in a, uh, in a safely uh, and, time, and timely way. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm new to this committee, uh, relatively new, uh, you know, joined in February, but uh, this, this has been an ongoing issue. Uh, and this is an issue that, uh, to be honest, as I kind of see the, the landscape right now, um, and then now understanding the history of 
This this happens on a regular basis. Uh, uh, even even without the you know the labor issues of return to COVID and all those pieces, uh, that um, this is going to repeat itself next year. Uh, if a family asks me right now, is this going to happen again? I'm going to say yes, yes, this is going to happen again. Um, I, I would very much bet on it. Um, I think that we should collaborate uh, with the as, as school committee with the superintendent on um, on ensuring that there is a, a, a committee or a task force uh, that school committee can help you know shape shape the charge, uh, shape the membership that we can play the, the role that we play in, in approving these agreements uh, with you know with the vendor. Um, an agreement, by the way, that when I first voted on this, uh, I think it was in the spring, uh, I did, you know, kind of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it diligence, it was, it was limited and ask around and it felt like a very perfunctory, we tried to fix us in the past, there's, you know, all these issues um, and, and we are where we are, uh, but I'm not inclined uh, to, uh, to exercise uh, my, you know, my approval going forward on these agreements until all the stakeholders are aligned uh, and, and by all stakeholders, you know, we're including, you know, not not just our, our, our partners who are the, the, the bus drivers who are working, uh, but um, you know, our, our city council, our mayor, um, all all the our, you know the the, the mayor uh, will be elected in November, of course, is a you know, longer term issue to address. Uh, that we all have to work together, and and I think that you know we as school committee can can convene uh, this task force to make sure we map out all of this kind of intricate kind of interplay of stakeholders. And make sure that this doesn't happen again. Uh, and to the extent that you know, me as school committee member, I want to play my role for that. And I hope I know that my colleagues will do will do the same. With uh, with respect to uh, the exam school uh, issue, uh, I, I appreciate um, the superintendent noting that. Um, I, I do want to say that I am disappointed. Uh, again, our you know school committee hat. Um, we are responsible uh, for this policy. Uh, it's in our, our purview. You know, we we um, you know we created it in the sense of approving it and 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 uh, setting out the process for which it would be created and approved. And uh, I can't do my job if I don't have the proper data. I conditioned my vote in July on receiving uh, uh, the data and the update uh, as implementation was going to start. Um, I understand the broader context, but I, I want to make sure to get on the record that um, as 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 we're all talking about the role of, uh, of you know, school committee in education, BPS in education, all these different pieces, um, that as a school committee member, I, I need that information, that data when I'm making policy and I don't have that. Uh, to that end, I am very concerned in this interim uh, period before we apply the permanent uh, policy uh, you know, post, post COVID, that for folks that have sixth graders right now that um, uh, I voted to approve uh, 10 points being applied to certain uh, certain schools is a change from the task force recommendation, but um, uh, you know I, I appropriately relied on the superintendent and um, and was supportive of it. Um, I've learned since then uh, from from families who've shown me their own analyses, their own spreadsheets that uh, their children by going to certain BPS schools because of uh, applying these 10 points to the schools uh, that they're going to have essentially or actually a 0% chance of getting into any of the exam school programs. Um, I, I wanna be clear, I, I never intended to support a policy that would do that. If I knew that it was going to do that, I would not have supported that policy. Uh, so in the October 6th meeting, um, I do wanna see data using the data that we relied on in July, uh, using the data that our task, the task force that we charged relied on in making all the recommendations and including the ones that we've, you know, we've changed and I think in some cases appropriately so uh, that we need to make sure that families right now who are in this weird interim period where there's no, you know, there's no exam, of course, being being uh, given. Um, I, I don't know if the, you know, the, the election will change that, um, but we can't have uh, a kid going to a school, a BPS school, and they have no chance to get into one of our programs. Uh, I think that's fundamentally unfair. Uh, and I would propose if that isn't, if that is the case, if these families are right, I hope that they're wrong, that, uh, that we suspend uh, at least for this interim period, the 10 points to the schools, not to the individual students that are getting it, you know, that subset that are getting it because of DCF or uh, or BHA status, but to the schools themselves, fundamentally unfair on that. So I want to put that on there um, and recommend to my colleagues to consider that too. You know, this is our policy. We, we're wearing this, um, that when we get our, this information on October 6th, that we make sure that for this coming year, that it's fair, uh, you know, for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent, did you want to respond? 
I appreciate that push. And um, on the on October 6, we will make sure that we present the data that's been requested. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and um, first of all, my congratulations to the new school leaders and appreciate uh, Dr. Booker and Mr. Booker for um, going through um, each of them and glad to see them on and, and I wish them well. I look forward to uh, visiting with them and encourage them to learn from their peers. Uh, we have a lot of school leaders doing tremendous work in Boston Public Schools and building your own network of support um, is, is crucial. And our school leaders are always respectful of each other, particularly our star school leaders. So uh, they all wanna help you, but they're not gonna offer. You have to reach out to them and ask them. Um, so that's my one piece of advice to you and they'll be glad to help. I do know in um, you're entering uh, with some great resources coming your way because in talking to school leaders now since school have has opened, you know, the good news now is with the new social workers that are in place, uh, the new family liaisons, increase in nurses, increase in custodians. Um, it is, this is uh, even in arts programs, this has been great. The resources that the superintendent and her team and the city has, has been able to bring to bear is really helping our school leaders. So delighted to see the new social workers in schools, the family liaisons in schools in particular, a lot of work that school leaders were doing themselves. So um, that is all good news. I do want to uh, mention two things. I first of all echo uh, Mr. DeRugio's comments about the exam schools. Um, our vote in July very specifically did ask for an update on uh, implementation in the fall. I, uh, like others, expected that we were going to have it today. I certainly understand uh, the superintendent and the team with the pressures that have been on their request to present this on October 6 and do support that. Um, I do echo the concerns uh, as I did that evening that we voted about the potential negative consequences of uh, the 10 points on some schools and look forward to seeing the simulation around that. Um, as well as the simulation around some of the other potential ideas that we floated that evening on ways to handle that. So I think that's a, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the overall plan that we proposed and that we approved that night or that I should say was proposed to us. Um, I also uh, expressed concerns that evening about un unintended consequences of one particular item and look forward to seeing that in more detail when it is, when the simulations are presented to us next week. I want to make most of my comments though about transportation and I appreciate um, the on-time percents that were put on there. I just, I really appreciate uh, superintendent that even as you said, you put those scores up and they are great scores, I call them, right? On-time percentages compared to previous years. I think the issue though is not, this year is not the issue of buses then being late and how do we get there? But it is really the um, buses that aren't showing at all or the bus that we don't have enough bus, bus drivers for or we're trying to get standby drivers for and we believe in the morning and not gonna be covered. And so transportation has to put out robocalls to parents and then that route may get covered but at that point parents have made alternative arrangements. Nothing is more frustrating. There are two things that are extremely frustrating for our parents right now. The first is making alternative arrangements in the morning and getting to a school to drop off your child. And then you see that bus is covered and it pulls up and it pulls up empty. Um, and they have made arrangements. The second though, and we've heard from a number of parents is we do have a problem with afternoon performance of bus drivers who are not covering for the full day and that they, um, we then have to make alternative arrangements for parents in the afternoon. And for a parent who has dropped their student off at school in the morning and gone to work and now is getting a call that, you know, your student does not have a, a ride home this afternoon um, is incredibly frustrating. And 
we do have a labor issue. There is no question about that. And I think people are respectful and understanding of that. You know, we're all know what it's like that our favorite stores are closed on a Monday or a Tuesday or a weekend because they can't get enough help. And I recognize we're doing that. This is a communications challenge as well in about how we communicate effectively and fairly with our parents and make sure they are heard and respected. So superintendent, I really appreciate that you're being proactive about this, that you're proposing to do a working group to take these transportation recommendations that have been made and really dig into them. I strongly encourage you to um, have parental representation on that from a range of parents across the city and um, to have student, potentially student, even though our high school students are more on, um, on MBTA, but have a, a student representative or two and some school leaders because they are the ones who are closest to the impact of this on a daily basis. So I look forward to your update on that next week and really appreciate that you're being proactive on this issue. Oh, thank you for that. And um, I look forward to this working group to get after some of those um, deeper systemic issues of around the performance. And I absolutely want to have high school students on because the MBTA does transfer our students. And I think their on time performance was 67% over the past seven days. So, you know, we want to make sure we're addressing that too. I got a text from Dorian um, saying that there was an issue with the 32 bus and I called up the MBTA and we started to problem solve and resolve the uh, crowded buses on that. So, you know, I appreciate the student feedback and the student voice and I want to have them at the table as well. Yeah, I just want to make sure we separate the out the issues of actually having the buses run and run on time and our communications with parents and families. Um, because there's a lot of confusion with parents. They get a robocall in the morning saying your bus isn't covered. Then when they're making their alternative arrangements, they get a call saying your bus is now covered and they've already left the school forward and, and left for school. And um, I appreciate we're trying to be proactive and reaching out, but we have to think long and hard about ways to improve the communication piece, even as we're solving the other larger uh, systemic issues. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that too. Um, sometimes we have driver absences and we think that, you know, we want to give parents the most amount of notice that we possibly can and so that they can make plans. And so we're going to work on our communications around that in the interim um, and not wait for the working group, but that will be something that we will separate out, uh, separate out in the purpose and the charge of this working group. Thank you, Superintendent. Mm -hmm. Ms. LaPera. Uh, thank you, Chair Robinson. Um, I just want to reiterate the pieces around transportation. Um, both uh, member Diarujo as well as member O'Neill have honed in on as a parent. Um, I know I have experienced personally in previous years the challenges around transportation. Um, and I am lucky enough to have the work flexibility to be able to figure it out. And we know that that's not necessarily the case for many of the students and families that attend um, Boston Public Schools. And so um, thank you for uh, putting in place or announcing um, the recommendation around a working group to think about these pieces. Um, I know that we are seeing some perhaps uh, increased numbers on on-time performance in comparison to years past. But the way I look at it is if we had a family who was chronically late, even by 15 minutes or by 30 minutes, we would be on top of them trying to figure out what is going on. And so I expect us to do the same for ourselves um, because that's instructional time, that is breakfast time for our students and we wanna make sure that they are on time. And, and in the afternoons, it's the same thing. There is nothing worse than being at work and getting a phone call saying, you have to figure out how to take care of your child. And so, that piece around communication is vital. And that is something that we have complete control over and that we have to address um, for our families. And that is our responsibility. Um, so thank you for um, thinking about how to begin to address these issues, not just for this year, but longer term. Um, and the piece around having high school representatives, sometimes those high school students 
our caregivers for our younger students who are also engaging with buses, um, as well as getting themselves to and from school and, and home. So um, I think the student and family voice is incredibly important uh, moving forward. So just wanted to make sure that those pieces were emphasized as much as they possibly could be. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Gracias, eh, señora presidenta. Eh, yo quiero eh, felicitar a, a la superintendente y a su equipo por tomar en cuenta eh, eh, la cultura latina. Vi que dentro de su programación eh, está eh, valorar lo que es la cultura latina, primeramente. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Superintendent, because of the fact that you're valuing what it is the uh, Hispanic heritage and the Latin culture in the first place. Estamos en un tiempo difícil, ¿verdad? Momentos eh, con todo este tema de la pandemia, sabemos que ha sido difícil. Sin embargo, lo que ha sido la, uh, el inicio académico, el, el problema de transportación, a quienes está afectando más el problema de transportación. Más de 25,000 estudiantes usan el transporte escolar. It's been a difficult year considering the pandemic crisis. Uh, we had a uh, difficult uh, beginning of the year. We have to consider transportation, the difficulties that had arisen because of transportation, and considering that the over 25,000 students depend on transportation. Y tengo entendido que eh, sé que han hecho, están haciendo eh, parte, eh, esfuerzos. Hay conversaciones que se están haciendo, valoro mucho que se estén haciendo esas conversaciones para poder llegar a, 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 a un acuerdo o básicamente para que eh, eh, nuestros estudiantes, nuestras familias puedan recibir ese, ese, la transportación adecuada que necesitan. I do understand that the uh, conversations are taking place. There is an effort, an embedded effort in this, you know, to be able to have the conversations that are required to be able to uh, reach an agreement that is uh, conducive to a solution to the situations. Sin embargo, quiero también puntualizar que los maestros de las escuelas públicas están haciendo un trabajo increíble, un trabajo de comunicación. Los maestros ahora mismo se están convirtiendo en psicólogos, asesores, hablando con las familias. Es fuerte, es, es, es para los maestros. Este año ha sido, uh, el comienzo de este año ha sido bien fuerte para ellos porque han tenido que asumir muchos roles aparte de lo académico. So we have to consider as well, and I do appreciate the, the team, the entire team. In particular, we have to consider the teachers. It has been a difficult work for them. We have to consider that uh, they are uh, doing their very best in terms of uh, enabling communication. They are becoming psychologists, some of them. They're becoming consultants, some of them. Talking to their families, we have to value the work that they're doing, the teachers themselves. También valoro mucho que de, la, de los nuevos líderes eh, principales uh, han escogido uh, eh, una gran parte que son bilingües y eso es importante para nuestra comunidad. I do appreciate the fact that the uh, new leaders that had been elected, some of them are bilingual, and this is very important. This is critical for our community. Y, y, sobre, y quiero enfatizar que algunos principales están haciendo un trabajo tan, tan bueno eh, para las escuelas que se han tenido que quedar, han dado la milla extra, porque se han tenido que quedar con los alumnos por problemas de transportación, que los buses no llegan a tiempo. Y aprecio y valoro muchísimo a estos principales que están haciendo estos trabajos. I'd like to emphasize as well and congratulate the exceptional job that some of the principals are doing in some events, staying later at school in order to be able to stay with the kids that uh, had a some type of trouble with transportation. They are going the extra mile in doing their jobs. I would like to commend all the principals for doing that. Creo que hay mucho, como decía señora Nani, eh, Ogni y Lorena, hay mucho por hacer. Creo que tenemos mucho, 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 mucho trabajo, muchas conversaciones pendientes, mucho por aportar y, y escuchar a los padres, escuchar a, eh, esos, a los estudiantes, a las comunidades, para que nosotros podamos saber las realidades de todas esas escuelas. Muchas gracias. Well, there's a lot of work to have, that has to be done, uh, as Mr. Arujo said, as uh, Ms. Lorena mentioned as well. 
communications must take place. We have to hear each other. We have to hear the communities. We have to hear the entire community that is embedded in this. And I do appreciate that very much. Families, communities working together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Coleman, Dean Coleman. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, first off, I want to um, say that I'm looking forward to getting the report on the scores differentiated by groups. I mean, that, I, mean I know there's a lot, a lot of numbers and you just got them, but um, it, 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 although it's less scary to know that we're performing relatively well compared to the state as a whole, and the, the, the drop in numbers as we've, we anticipated are very scary. So the more, uh, the more analysis we have that where, where, where that's happening, um, if there's any schools that are particularly um, subject to larger than average drops and what the, the, the learning plan is, I look forward to getting that material. I know that you're working on that, but uh, be nice to, for the for us in the community to see that data uh, differentiated by groups and also uh, what uh, the picker schools to which uh, our concerns need to be higher um, and then what what's the the intervention plan as we move forward in this very difficult situation no one's surprised by the drop disappointed scared but we want to hear the solutions and and, and targeted solutions because I don't think it's going to be the same across the whole district so by group and what, what, what schools are, are most harmed and what's our plan around those. I know that's gonna be part of uh, uh, Chief Harris's work and others. That, that's, that's one request. Um, the second I want to, um, you know, obviously I, I always want the data it, with a couple of years so we can see the comparisons, but eyeballing it, there's a significant increase in BIPOC principles and, and bilingual principles. And we know that's the linchpin for our, our efforts to diversify our, our workforce uh, so that we'll be more present available to all our students. So I want, I want to really congratulate you and your team on making that significant progress because it's hard work. But I think uh, hopefully this will be getting close to the tipping point where it'll, it'll improve our hiring processes and then make us more attractive uh, to uh, diverse uh, leaders um, from around the country. And I also appreciate the degree to which you have reached around the country for leadership and that clearly making uh, this an attractive place for people to, to, to move to, even if they're coming. Uh, so thanks for, and I want and I do want to uh, uh, share my uh, colleagues concerns about finding a way to get a really good analysis of our, our the challenge to our transportation, which is, uh, is a multi-year problem and needs a multi-year solution includes and, and many factors, but I don't think we have figured out exactly what all the drivers are and what are our attempts to change them in addition to losing, you know, the, 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 the difficulty. Of, there's a lot of um, planning that is very hard to do. And we, we you know, for all of us have been on the committee for a period of time, uh, we share the despair that we, we, we don't have an answer for next year already. I mean, we know that and, and engaging in a process where we can figure out a plan for resolving um, transportation without my solution, which would be neighborhood schools. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I agree with all of the comments that my fellow members have made with regard to the, the needs of our focus around the exam school issues as well as particularly transportation. But for me, I think what I've stepped came away with this week is just the importance of improving our communication overall. There have been so many issues or so many things that, I mean, there's a lot of information coming out of the district to parents. But sometimes I feel like there's so much of it and it's not all very clear um, that it just feels like it's very overwhelming. And knowing that we're trying to communicate around COVID issues and testing and what happens if your child is impacted or a teacher or a classroom, I'm hoping that there are ways that we can simplify and make available quickly the links to where people will find information around those things. And again, the issue, as I said, is it's wonderful it is to have 90% of our buses on time, 
if you're one of those parents whose child is in that 10%, um, you know, it, it's not making you very happy. And I know that we are doing a mammoth job, so I don't want it all to under, underplay the importance of where we are. But, you know, again, it's, it's not until every child, as we say in our creed, it's every child in every school has what they need. And that includes an on-time bus, all of the things that, that come with it. So I'm just hoping that we can both pull together as a district and as a city um, to really support all of our kids and families as we start the school year, because we know we've got a large mountain to climb um, in terms of getting from where we were with the pandemic and the pandemic is not over yet, um, getting through all the changes that are going on in the city, but focusing and keeping our eyes on trying to make this district work for every student that we have. And um, I commend the, the new um, hires that we have for school leaders. I've had the privilege of meeting two of them so far, Mr. Brown and also Ms. Whitmore and welcome them um, to the district. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from them, having a chance to get out to schools and meet them and continuing to move forward the best way we possible in this school year, we can in this school year. So thank you, Superintendent. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So is there, if there's no further discussion, I now entertain a motion to receive the superintendent's report. Can I, I'm sorry. So, I excuse little... me, yes, before we go for, yeah, Mr. Adair Rougeau, you have another comment? Uh, so quick question just on, uh, if there was an update on COVID, COVID testing, um, the, the consents in both, I guess, is has it started? I know some schools, I've seen some email traffic around starting and just want to see if there's any update uh, on that. We are doing the COVID testing. We started last Thursday um, and Friday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will we'll be the full round. Um, Ms. Costello is on. I don't know if you saw you put your film on. Do you have some updates? Just wanted to be here to support if need be. Um, yeah, we have started testing last week, last Thursday, and it's been going on at schools. Definitely um, some challenges as we you know get it up and running, but we're working very closely with our partners at CIC and um, some of the vendors that they're working with to work through some of those kinks. Um, but we do expect that every school will have testing completed by this Thursday, at least the first round. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Chair Robinson, may I just uh, very quickly apologize uh, to Chief Harris for having his name wrong, uh, incorrect earlier uh, during my comments. I realized a mistake. So my apologies to Chief Harris and thank you for that excellent introduction of the school leaders. Thank you. All right. Okay. So I will now entertain a motion to receive the superintendent's report. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rujo? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. It's unanimous, thank you. Thank you. And before we move on to general public comment, I'd like to invite Director of Labor Relationships, um, Jeremiah Hassan, to present a brief report on a tentative collective bargaining agreement between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Teachers Union regarding health and safety for school year 21 to 22. The com committee will take action on this agreement later this evening. First, I'd like to invite the superintendent to give opening remarks. I wanna thank Mr. Hassan and the whole team that got together and President Tang for this agreement. I think it's an important agreement to move us forward for the health and safety measures that we are have already been taking in our schools and have been taking for the entire pandemic. And so I appreciate his leadership in uh, getting this agreement with our Boston uh, Teachers Union partners. So thank you. Mr. Zahn. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, committee members, for having me tonight. 
I'm here on behalf of the BPS bargaining team to present the recent tentative agreement with the Boston Teachers Union regarding health and safety for the 2021-22 school year and to request that the school committee vote in favor of the agreement. Before I get into the terms of the agreement, I'd like to highlight the district's priorities going into the negotiations with the BTU. First and foremost, the superintendent and the district and school leaders are committed to promoting a safe and welcoming learning and working environment for our students and staff. And we sought an agreement that reflected that commitment. Second, we wanted to ensure full cooperation from the BTU with the city of Boston's COVID-19 vaccination verification or required testing policy. And finally, we also wanted to negotiate an agreement that is fair and equitable for our BTU members while also being fiscally responsible and sustainable. Moving into the terms of the agreement, after multiple bargaining sessions, the parties agreed to the following safety measures. First, all schools would have designated isolation spaces for students with COVID symptoms. BPS will provide appropriate PPE in accordance with DESI and CDC guidance. BPS will install and maintain air quality data loggers to track CO2 levels in classrooms. BPS will continue to monitor classroom temperatures and make reports available upon request. BPS will allow all staff to participate in building pool testing. And for employees who develop COVID symptoms during the day, BPS will provide self-administered rapid tests with a goal of keeping more of our employees in buildings and serving students. BPS will continue to adhere to the BPHC's contact, tr contact tracing protocols and will continue publishing COVID positive cases by school on its website. BTU will agree to accept the city of Boston's COVID vaccination verification or required testing policy. In connection with the policy, the city and BPS has expanded COVID related paid time off opportunities for BTU members to recover or to care for dependents who are recovering from COVID. And finally, BPS agreed that while schools remain fully in person, teachers will not be required to teach students who are in-person and students who are remote simultaneously. In the event that students are required to quarantine, teachers are required to provide daily coursework that students can access digitally while they are remote so that the students can work with tutors to maintain pace with their classrooms while they are quarantined. So that, those are the terms of the agreement. On behalf of the bargaining team, I wanna thank the BTU and its leadership for their efforts and collaboration in reaching this agreement. I also wanna extend a thank you to our facilities team for, from our management, to our plan administrators, planning and engineering team, and our building custodians for all their work, getting our buildings ready and ensuring that they're clean and safe for all of our students and staff. With that, I reiterate my recommendation that the committee vote in favor of the agreement, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hassan, for that report. I'll now open it up to the committee for any questions or comments. None? No additional questions or comments? Okay, thank you. Um, the committee looks forward to thank taking you. action. Okay, thank you. The committee looks forward to taking action on this tentative collective bargaining agreement later this evening. Thank you again for all your hard work in getting this far. Thank you. Thank you. Now All righty. Thank you. We'll now move on to general public comment. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time but a refer to the superintendent for later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. We have 24 speakers for general public comment. Each person will have two minutes to speak, and I will remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks 
or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please direct your comments to the chair and refrain from addressing individual school committee members or district staff. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure that you're signed into Zoom with the same name you use to sign up for public comment. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera when it's your turn to testify. Only speakers who turn on their camera will be allowed to testify. Otherwise, speakers can submit their testimony in writing. We'll begin this evening with our speakers who will be using Spanish interpretation services. I will now turn off the interpretation icon. Interpreters and the public will all be in the main room. Interpreters, please stop interpreting and mute yourself for this part of the testimony. We'll begin with Sonia Medina. Sonia Medina. Followed by Carrie Cabrera, Albani Carmona, Maria Mejia, Josefina Burgos, and Noemi Rodriguez. Sonia Medina. Sí, buenas noches. Hello. Good evening. Eh, okay. Buenas, buenas noches a todos y a todas. Gracias por la oportunidad de expresarme. Good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to express myself. Mi nombre es Sonia Medina. Soy de República Dominicana. Tengo dos niños y asisten a la escuela Ocho en Galve. My name is Sonia Medina. I am from the Dominican Republic. I have two children, and they attend Orchard Garden. Ya, ya comenzaron la clase y estoy muy frustrada porque el viernes mi hijo llega a la casa quejándose de dolor. The uh, classes has just started and I feel quite frustrated because my son comes home complaining of pain. El dolor era detrás de la oreja cuando lo cheque cheque cuando chequeé a mi hijo tenía la oreja raja y cortada de la máscara, de la mascarilla. So he was complaining that the pain was behind his ears. So I went to check behind his ears and I was able to see that he had some lacerations on the back because of the um, mask. Creo, okay. Creo que no es justo que los estudiantes en vez de salir con deseo de regresar a la escuela uh, al otro día, tengan que llegar con dolor y frustración a la casa. No es justo. I don't think that is fair for the children to have to uh, return home complaining because they should be looking forward to attend school the next day, not having to come back home with uh, pains like my son did. He hablado con padres fuera de la escuela y tienen la misma preocupación que yo, también sobre lo que está pasando dentro de la escuela. I have spoken with different parents and they have the same concerns that I do. Um, These concerns about their kids. Sobre que los niños no están aguantando la mascarilla dentro de la, del aula. And it's basically the complaint that it's very difficult for the kids to maintain the mask on throughout the day. Pregunto, ¿qué va a pasar si un estudiante da positivo a un maestro? ¿Tendremos los padres que enviar a nuestros hijos a la escuela? So my question is, what would happen if one of the kids uh, is um, tested and has COVID, or one of the adults uh, is tested and has COVID, are we sending our kids to school? ¿Qué pasará si no quiero enviar a mi hijo a la escuela si en su aula da un niño positivo? What happens uh, if I don't want to send my kid 
to school if I know that one of his classmates has tested positive for COVID? Si un niño da positivo y tiene que quedarse en casa, ¿cuál es, cuál es el plan que tienen para ese estudiante? So if uh, one of the kids uh, tests positive and has to stay home, what are the academic plans that the district has for that kid that is sick? What is necessary? What? No. Excuse me, 20 seconds. Okay. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Um, if we could get her number, I'll have somebody give her a call uh, from our from our uh, welcome um, center. I tell her that, Superintendent Sonia, eh, la superintendente quiere que usted eh, comparta su número de teléfono. Ella va a poner una persona para que le pueda explicar eh, lo que usted está preguntando. Bueno, está bien. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carrie and Albani are not signed into the meeting. So our next speaker will be Maria Mejia. Maria Mejia, estamos buscando para que por favor participe en su testimonio. Sí, me escuchan. Do you hear me? Sí, la estamos escuchando, María. Ok, buenas noches a todos el comité de la escuela pública. So good evening to the school committee. Eh, muchas gracias por la oportunidad de expresarme. Thank you so much for letting me express myself. Eh, mi nombre es María Mejía, vivo en la comunidad de Rosberry. My name is Maria Mejia and I live in Roxbury. Tengo un niño de seis años que asiste a la escuela pública de Blaston. I have a six-year-old son that attends the Blaston school. La preocupación que quiero expresar, eh, que no se han abierto como se debe eh, la vacuna en los maestros, que todavía todos no están vacunados. So my concern is that we have started schools and classes and uh, my understanding is that not all the teachers, not all the uh, school personnel has been vaccinated. Y deberían estar vacunados para no eh, poner el, en riesgo la salud de nuestros niños. No, the adults should be vaccinated so that our children are not at risk. Mi mayor preocupación son los padres que no están vacunados y también envía a sus hijos a la escuela. The concern that I have is for the families that are not vaccinated, the parents are not vaccinated, and yet they send their, school, their kids to school. Aumentando el riesgo a los demás, deberían exigir que los padres que envían sus hijos a las escuelas eh, pública estén todos vacunados. Uh, my recommendation is that uh, the parents, families that are sending their kids to school, it should be mandated that they are uh, vaccinated to uh, avoid more risk. Otro punto es el protocolo a seguir cuando el alumno es positivo al COVID asintomatizado. Another concern that I have is uh, what is the protocol? I'm not aware what happens when a student uh, is uh, infected with COVID. Para que en esos de 10 a 14 días no sean, eh, no se desconecte tanto del programa de la clase. Because those um, 10 to 14 days of uh, Quarantine. I would like to know what is go, what is the plan so the kid is not disconnected from the academic program. Agradezco mucho a todos los que están trabajando por las escuelas públicas. 
I am very thankful for everybody that is working so hard in the public schools. Pero temas como seguridad eh, ante el contagio del COVID, eh, transporte, el protocolo y el espacio son temas. Um, very thankful. However, I am very concerned with the safety of everybody, especially if there is someone uh, that is that has COVID. What is the protocol? What uh, would happen? Twenty seconds. So, son temas que están pro quitándonos la tranquilidad a todos los padres. Muchas gracias. Because all, all of these themes about the COVID are really making us concerned. So I want to hear more details, please. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Let's try Albani Carmona again. Albani Car Carmona, if you're signed into the meeting, can you please raise your hand? Están preguntando a la señora Carmona que si usted está aquí en la reunión, por favor, levante su mano para participar y dar su testimonio. ¿Y dónde lo van? Oh. Yeah. Good evening. Buenas noches. Sí, muy buenas noches. Mi nombre es Albany Carmona. So, uh, good evening. My name is Albany Carmona. Eh, dándole las gracias primeramente a Dios y a cada uno de ustedes por darme la oportunidad de expresar mi mortificación. I want to thank God and each one of you for giving me the opportunity to express my concerns. Este es el primer año que uso el transporte público de las escuelas de Boston. First year that I am using the public transportation of the district. Para transportar mis, mis niños desde la escuela Kelly KI8, que está en la Central Street, hasta la Chamon Avenue, en el programa To Be Ready de San Steven. I'm using the transportation uh, to move my kids from the K-8 Center in the Chamon Street, from Center Street to Chamon Street. El lunes fue un día frustrante que nunca voy a olvidar en mi vida. Very frustrated day for me. I will never forget it. Mis niños fueron dejados por el transporte público de Boston en una esquina sin un adulto. My kids were dropped off in a corner of one of the streets in Boston with no adult in presence. Dos niños de siete y nueve años. My kids are seven and nine years old. Cuando me comunico a las escuelas públicas de Boston, me dicen que este es el stop y les comunico que yo pedí que me lo lleven a un programa, no que me lo abandonen en una esquina. So when I called transportation, I was informed that that is the stop where they need to be dropped. And I said that that was not the agreement where I wanted my kids to be dropped. El martes me eh, dejó de trabajar y me dirijo a la Kelly. So Tuesday, I didn't go to work. Donde pido hablar con el encargado de los transportes de la escuela y me dice que no me puede atender, pero que él me va a llamar. So I uh, ask if I can speak to the person in charge of uh, transporting my kids. And I received the message that they are not able to talk to me, but they got my number and they were going to call me. Luego me llama y me dice que las escuelas no son responsables del de lugar, el esto de mis hijos, que, te, que tiene que ser la oficina de transportación que me tiene que solucionar el problema. So they, uh, the school calls me back and they tell me that the school is not responsible for the uh, corner or the stop where transportation drop my kids, that it has to be transportation, the ones that will be responsible for that. 
es una persona de San Steven que me está ayudando porque yo trabajo a recoger mis niños, pero quiero saber cuál será la solución cuando mis hijos tienen que, que estar en un programa y no que me lo dejen en una esquina. So somebody from uh, St. Stephen is trying to help me out. I work, so I'm not able to um, lose any more working days. I would like to know what is the solution so my kids are not dropped in a corner because they need to be attending an after school program. Muchísimas gracias y en lo que me puedan ayudar se lo voy a agradecer. Thank you so much. Whatever you can do to help me out, uh, please do so. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Josefina Burgos. Josefina Burgos. Señora Josefina Burgos. ¿Se encuentra señora Josefina Burgos? Estamos esperando que se presente para hacer su declaración. Miss Burgos is not responding. Buenas noches, ¿me escuchan? Oh, yeah. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Mi sí, buenas es noches. Josefina, mi nombre es Josefina Burgos y tengo una niña que asiste a la Russell Elementary School. Yes, my name is Josefina Burgos and I have a daughter um, and she goes to the Roosevelt School. La verdad es que me he sentido sumamente preocupada con la apertura de este año escolar. Uh, the truth is that I've been very concerned um, with the opening of this new school year. Es tanto así que mi hija no asistió a la escuela la primera semana. It's so much like that that my daughter didn't even um, assist to school on the first week. Porque no me sentí en confianza, ya que ella padece de anemia falciforme. Because I didn't feel comfortable. Um, she suffers sickle cell disease. Y es muy vulnerable al COVID-19. So she's very vulnerable to COVID-19. Así que decidí asistir a la escuela donde hablé con la enfermera. So I decided to go to school and I spoke to the nurse. La cual me dio todas las, la cual me dijo todas las medidas que se están tomando para la reapertura. And she told me all the measures uh, that have been taken to the reopening. Luego hablé con la doctora de mi hija. And after that I spoke to my daughter's primary care. Y esta me dijo que la enviara. And then she told me that I could send her to school. Y que si en algún caso ella se sentía sofocada por el uso de la mascarilla. And that in any case that she felt um, suffocated by the use of the mask. Que le pidiera break a la maestra. That I could ask for a mask break. To the teacher. Gracias a Dios, todo ha estado bien con ella. Thank God everything has been good with her. Pero aún así me siento muy preocupada con esta situación. But even so, I'm still very concerned with the para situation. Mí, para mí y para ella es más seguro y yo estaría más tranquila si las clases continuaran virtual. To me and for her. It would be um, better and safely if the classes could continue remotely and I will be at peace. Por lo tanto, les pido que tomen en cuenta una segunda opción para las clases virtuales. Therefore, I'm asking 
for you to consider a second option for the remote classes to continue. Para las familias que están en mi misma situación, gracias. For the families that are in the same situation as mine. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Our next speaker is Noemi Rodriguez. Nuestra próxima presentadora es la señorita Noemi Rodriguez. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Noemi Rodríguez. Soy un organizador con raíces verdes. También soy un activista comunitario dentro de la comunidad de East Boston. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is Noemi Rodríguez. I am an organizer with the uh, Green Roots as well as a community organizer. También soy una madre con tres niños bajo los órdenes de IP dentro de las escuelas públicas de Boston. I am also a mother of three children with IPs programs in the Boston Public Schools. Quiero relatar algo estresante, algo frustrante, algo terrible que pasó con mi hijo. I wanted to uh, relate uh, something very stressful, something very frustrating and terrible that happened with one of my children. El día jueves 9 de septiembre, mi hijo se dirigió a la escuela. On Thursday, September 9, my son uh, went to school. En la hora del regreso, a las 3 de la tarde, me estaban llamando que el niño no tiene transporte. And at the time of um, returning home, at 3 o'clock p.m., they were calling me, telling me that my son did not have transportation. Para mí fue preocupante, ya que me toca trabajar y no tengo un carro para movilizarme hasta Brighton desde East Boston. And for me, it was very um, concerning because I was working. I uh, do not have a car to transport myself from Brighton to East Boston. Mi hijo anduvo perdido alrededor de tres horas dentro del bus con otros tres niños más de East Boston. So my son was lost inside of the bus for approximately three hours with other three children from East Boston. Mi hijo abordó el bus a las tres y cuarenta y cinco de la tarde. Y llegó a las ocho y cuarenta y ocho que la directora lo trajo a casa. My son got on the bus, coming back home at 3.45 p.m., did not get home until 8.48 p.m. when the principal actually brought it to home. Basado al tiempo que nos han dado de dos minutos, yo voy a enviar una carta al superintendente explicando cuál fue la situación de mi hijo y esto quiero que no pase más ni conmigo ni con ningún otro padre. So based on the time that we have a lot today, which is two minutes, I am going to write a letter that I will be sending to the superintendent because I don't like or I don't want this to happen again, neither to myself or any other family. Ahora mi hijo está traumado que no quiere abordar el bus porque él se había perdido. No quiere ir más a la escuela por la misma situación del transporte. So now my son is scared. He has a trauma. He doesn't want to go to school anymore because he was lost. And he doesn't feel like he wants to go to school anymore. Desde ese día, mi hijo no ha ido a la escuela y está en casa porque estoy buscando una respuesta de la violación del derecho del IP bajo la orden. Se puede traducir. And since that day, my son has attended school because I am waiting for a response for the violation of his IEP program. Que hasta la fecha no he tenido una respuesta. 
Hey, and as, of, okay, and as of today, I haven't obtained a response and I need <laughs> to get a response. Que mi hijo continúe estudiando, pero quiero una seguridad con el transporte público porque yo no tengo carro y soy una madre que estoy luchando sola con mis hijos. So I want a response and I want that my son continue studying, taking the public transportation, but I want that to happen in a safely manner. I am a single mother, uh, mother and I do not have help with transportation for my son. Esto es intolerable, irreparable, el daño físico de un niño, el trauma y la inseguridad que ahora existe en nuestros hijos. So this is an irreparable damage to my son. This is inappropriate. The physical damage and all the damage that has been happening to my son, particularly in these days when there is so much insecurity that our children are living through. Pienso que las escuelas, el plan educativo debió de preguntar a los padres Si la transportación iba a tener un efecto negativo, padres que tienen que trabajar para mantener a las familias. So I believe um, the transportation department should consider the impact that this will have on the working parents who does not have any option to transport their children to their school. Sabiendo que East Boston ha sido una de las comunidades más impactadas por el COVID, debieron de tomar prioridades con nuestros hijos. So knowing that East Boston was more one of the more hit one um, communities with the pandemic, they should have taken a different measures uh, when it comes to transportation for our children. Excuse me, Ms. Rodriguez. Excuse me for eh, permiso, señora Rodríguez. We do have your phone number and we're going to share that with a, a member of the staff to follow up with you quickly. Nosotros tenemos su número de teléfono, señora Rodríguez, y lo vamos a compartir con miembros del personal para darle seguimiento a esa situación rápidamente. Por favor, porque mi hijo está en casa y necesito que él tenga la educación adecuada dentro de, de Estados Unidos. Gracias. Okay. I'll thank you very much because uh, my son is still at home and I need him to continue with his education, uh, the education that he deserves inside of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now glasses. activate, excuse me. I will now activate the interpretation icon. All interpreters will be sent to your channels and you can start interpreting again. We'll move on to our next group of speakers, starting with Mike Heishman, followed by John Mudd, Ruby Reyes, Allison Cox, and Susan Mays Rothstein. If you could all please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Mike Heishman. Uh, did I click the right one? Yes, good evening. Oh, good, okay, thank you. Mike Heisman, Dorchester, Beja. One, Bill BPS, a 21st century solution for generations of neglect. Excellent facilities, an essential component for excellence for all. Monumental project has been a bad soap opera. Where is the juice? Where is the plan? Too often BPS delivers nightmares instead of appropriate facilities. Broken promises, broken hearts, betrayal. Where's the plan? We could stop blaming Trump. Biden is the POTUS and calling the co shots for COVID. The number of cases continues to rise. Pediatric cases have skyrocketed since August. The BPS under pressure from both the national and state governments fully reopened its schools to all students starting on September 9th. We had some very good news this week that more, more of our younger children will soon become vaccinated. It will take some time. Meanwhile, the schools are fully open. We welcome our children into unsafe buildings as they are accompanied by millions of tiny little infectious things. 
Gone is the parent option to safely keep their children home and continue their education remotely. Gone is the hybrid model, which provides provided safe distancing. We know that the Delta variant is much more infectious, but this significant fact has not modified our strategy. Safe distancing is now impossible in our schools. We are not following the science. More of our children and our educational workers will be infected. Our new POTUS continues to mandate unsafe policies. Capitalism demands that our schools be reopened so that we could go back to work. Profits are more important than people, more important than our children's health and lives. Thank you, Caselius, for making weekly COVID reports publicly. Thank you very much. I fear that some of our schools will become super spreaders. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Mudd. Is that working? Yes, good evening. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm a resident, John Mudd. I'm a resident of Cambridge, a member of the Boston Network of Black Student Achievement and the ELL Task Force. Uh, tonight, I want to focus on the issue that it is finally time for the school committee to take a clear stance on the policy of access to native language for English learner students. The education experts that I talk to say that access to native language is critically important as a building block for learning academic English. The parents I talk to say it is crucial for their children's access to learning, for their children's ability to relate to family and grandparents, and for their children to value their culture, their heritage, and their own self-worth. You know the large numbers of students affected by this policy. This is not a trivial issue. This is four years after the Look Act gave BPS the flexibility to use native language and overcome the straitjacket of English immersion that was foisted on Boston by question two. We still don't have a strategic plan for English learners and English learners with disabilities that takes advantage of the Look Act potential for using native language. In this connection at the last school committee meeting, I asked what guidance for innovative programming for English learners and English learners with disabilities had been sent to school leaders for the use of the $50 million in ESSER funds that have been allocated to schools for English learners, students with disabilities, and low-income students. I haven't seen anything. Have you? I didn't see anything on the document before you tonight that had a category even for English learners with disabilities. We are in danger of losing a major opportunity to use this supplemental federal funding as leverage to improve the educational programs that data continues to show fail our students. Finally, there's also a current search for a new assistant superintendent for the Office of English Learners. It would be extremely important for the school committee to send the message that the new leader of OEL must have the vision, the commitment, and the managerial skill to lead BPS and the systemic changes necessary to provide access to native language. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. Our next speaker is Ruby Reyes. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance and a Dorchester resident. BPS leadership has continued a dangerous trend of being rhetoric rich and implementation poor. Central office leadership use equity, anti-racism and accountability regularly. However, BPS leadership has gutted the meaning of the terms most especially in transportation, build BPS, the updated code of conduct, plans for English learners, students with disabilities, and academic recovery. Equity and anti-racism means that historically marginalized communities, including Black, Latino, students with disabilities, and English learners would have what they need. Where is this happening in the ongoing transportation issues? Are you able to guarantee students will get home as well as school on time? Where is this happening in Bill BPS? 
Where is this happening in communities that have been the hardest hit by COVID? Where is this happening in the updated code of conduct? It is not enough to just mention restorative justice. Families were told that there is a bus driver shortage and a bus monitor shortage. Missing from the announcements were details about who was going to be most impacted or how BPS central office is working with families to problem solve. A national bus driver shortage has been cited as an ongoing struggle. However, we know that transportation has always been a chronic problem before the shortage and before the pandemic. Cities like Philadelphia are paying families a monthly stipend to drive their children to and from school. In communities where families are most, mostly using pub public transportation, is paying families to carpool even being considered? Where is the, re the reimagined work to communicate and creatively problem solve with families? ESSER funds are for this type of problem solving. Why is it not happening? In October, Nate Cooter will discuss the major capital work of Build BPS. How many more of our school communities will be destroyed in the name of building BPS? We know there is no designated swing space. This means you will tear apart school communities followed by duplicitous term laments of being kept up at night by the decisions you are choosing to make or ignore. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Allison Cox. Thank you. My name is Allison Cox and I live in Jamaica Plain. I have two kids at Mission Hill School and I joined the school's governance board last year. The district's recent actions have harmed our school. The removal of the school's co-leaders just weeks before the school year began was disruptive. The removal of two lead teachers two days after the school year began was destructive. I support adherence to policy and appreciate that a large system can be slow to react, but these removals stem from actions occurring between 2014 and 2019 a time largely before co-leaders were in leadership positions. The district has admitted it was aware in 2020 and yet it waited until now to act. If, and I think this is a big if, if the recent investigation was unbiased and conducted in good faith to the entire school community, the district owes us an explanation as to why it elected to wait to make drastic changes until the worst possible time. Our students and teachers are returning from a pandemic while still in a pandemic and they deserve stability. The district has also acted with indifference to the pilot agreement and has been undermining the school governance board's authority. The governance board was not made aware that a months long investigation was occurring. The superintendent, superintendent just mentioned weekly meetings with the board chair. For the record, the first meeting happened today at 4 p.m. Until the day the district had not communicated to the board about teachers being removed, the plans for learning coaches to cover classes, nor had it been updated or consulted in over a month. The board holds responsibility for major curriculum, staffing, and scheduling decisions, as well as budget, budget oversight. It's clear that the district has not been acting in accordance with the MOU. The superintendent publicly promised additional resources and support, but so far we're seeing loss. We have lost all before and after school programming, students whose families can't make the school day only hours work alone, students whose families, both current and future, have, who have been falsely led to believe the school is not a safe place, regular communication above the classroom level, confidence that special education students are being appropriately served, in which in an inclusion model has real consequences for everyone in the building, continuity on our transformation team and trust in the district's intentions. I ask this committee, committee ensure that the district provide written confirmation to honor the autonomy of the school, meet special ed compliance within a week and hire highly qualified full-time teachers within a month. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Mays Rothstein. She'll be followed by Laura McCune Poplin, Andrew Liff, Avery Salnier de Reyes, and Riyad Lobardi. If you could all please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Susan Mays Rothstein. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, members of the committee and members of the BPS community, good evening. My name is Susan Mays Rothstein. I'm here in my capacity as a co-chair of the Code of Conduct Advisory Council, a volunteer group of community members created by the school committee in 2010. 
Tonight, COCAC responds to the fourth iteration of the code across the decade, this decade of service. This has been a disruptive nearly two years. There have been so many demands on school leaders that must have felt like a choice between policy and survival. Our hearts go out to all educators and to all the students and families they serve. Unfortunately, I'm here to tell you that for the first time since its inception, despite improvements that you will hear about later and, the, um, at the, and that COCAC supports and suggested, COCAC cannot support the adoption of the code of conduct proposed this evening for two main reasons. First, for the reason like those, for reasons like those I just stated, BPS did not apply the racial equity planning tool to this code. Simply put, the code is a major gatekeeping tool and no document of its magnitude and vast impact on its educational opportunities should be passed by this committee without thorough consideration of how it implicates racial justice. Second, the code fails to commit the district to meaningful community-based restorative justice. Likely in part because of the racial equity planning tool was not applied, this code continues to reflect three competing paradigms that create internal contradictions. The three un unreconciled approaches are first, an individualistic legal rights approach that, that operates as a punitive adversarial exclusionary model. Second, an individualistic social and emotional behaviorist approach, which places the burden on students while ignoring underlying systemic issues of racism and other root causes of negative behavior. And three, a nascent community building restorative justice approach, which while holding great promise underscored by years of work in a segment of Boston Public Schools is barely mentioned in the proposed code. In failing to resolve the contradictions that these competing paradigms represent, we all fail in our big goal of creating equitable and supportive school com communities for students. The district will continue to struggle with its goals outlined in the superintendent's strategic plan and opportunity to learn standards without a systemic supported commitment to restorative justice and, racially, and a racially just code. COCAC asks this committee to reaffirm its commitment to the code, to developing a code that stands as a model in its attempts to support, educate, and nurture all students in a just school environment, to reject this code or to adopt it only as an interim measure and instruct BPS to submit a new code by the fall of 2022 um, that incorporates a whole school restorative justice approach uh, to building community and racial equity and to assure the submission both relies on and passes with flying colors, the racial equity planning tool. Um, B, to uh, provide the BPS schools with a whole school restorative justice model is started in the 2019 through 2021 National Institute of Justice and American Institutes of Research grant offer also the training of restorative justice practices to the school committee, to all Boston Public Schools central office leaders and personnel, operational leaders, principals, and assistant principals, deans of, and deans of students, hire more restorative justice coaches. And um, if the committee desires the collaborative work to continue between COCAC and the Boston Public Schools to provide tangible, tangible support in the form of part-time community organizer. Um, who was paid. Um, we you, have- Dr. Mays Rothstein, if you could please wrap up your comments. Thank you. We have provided additional statements in our written testimony and I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you everyone. Thank you. We did just receive your testimony and I'll be sure to share that with the committee and the superintendent and her team. So thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Laura McCune Poplin. Okay, um, my name is Laura McCune Poplin. I'm a Mission Hill School parent and I live in Jamaica Plain. My son Emrick, a sixth grader was four when he was diagnosed with a motor tick disorder, which when aggravated by stress can become so noticeable 
that he has been mocked in public by total strangers. Fortunately, he has spent the last three years in the classrooms of expert teachers where his differences did not matter and he was able to learn freely without fear of mockery. These are the same teachers who were removed on the second day of school without explanation or warning in the middle of an already destabilizing pandemic. Emmerich loves his teachers. He talks about them all the time. When we discovered that he had been assigned to a different room this year, we begged for Emmerich to be returned to his original class with its nurturing environment of social acceptance and academic stimulation. We were in a laundromat when we found out that Mission Hill had heard our pleas and for once, Emmerich didn't care what other people thought of him. He started jumping, punching the air and screaming yes. Now, thanks to BPS, every night I spend bedtimes calming his anxiety about school. Will sixth grade be a waste of time? Why would BPS take away his two favorite teachers? Will he ever get into college? My grandfather dropped out of elementary school. My mother never went to college and my dad could only afford California State School because he enlisted as a 17-year-old Marine in Vietnam. But as a sixth grader, Emmerich has an opportunity to try for the same school that Benjamin Franklin and Wendell Phillips attended. Only the exam that might have admitted him has been taken away for reasons of equity and equality, reasons that I support. But now his teacher has been taken away from him too, putting my son and his classmates many who are from diverse backgrounds at a severe disadvantage, thereby creating more inequality and proving BPS's actions to be political rather than in the best interest of their students. I join with other Mission Hill parents to ask that BPS honor the autonomy of the Mission Hill School Governing Board's authority to search and select new leadership, meet special education compliance within one week for all students, and hire two highly qualified full-time teachers within one month. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Lipp. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Good evening. Uh, Chair Robinson and members of the school committee, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Andrew Eiliff. I'm a Mission Hill school parent to a current kindergartner and to a Mission Hill alumnus. Um, I would like to endorse what Allison and Laura and the other parents have said earlier and then just add just a little bit about my family's experience. My older child spent four formative years in the classroom of two experienced and accomplished Mission Hill teachers of color who were summarily placed on administrative leave by the superintendent on the second day of school leaving 35 children without adequate supervision or instruction, as you've heard. I and my family are working hard to keep an open mind about this decision. Just because the two suspended teachers were so spectacularly good for my child doesn't mean that they never made any mistakes. Like all of us, they're only human. Though what they did often seemed superhuman. They helped our sensitive child learn to be part of a complex and diverse classroom. They recreated their classrooms online during a pandemic. Words cannot describe how happy our child was to return to the, his classroom, the classroom of one of these two suspended teachers when schools reopened last year. The district has shared no information about the decision to, spend, to, to suspend these teachers. Parents of children in those classrooms receive misleading emails and the broader community like me has been told absolutely nothing at all. These are two of the most senior teachers remaining at the school after the suspension of the school's co-lead teachers. These teachers are critical to the stability, recovery, and institutional memory at Mission Hill. The superintendent's decision to suspend these teachers now at the beginning of the school year in the middle of a pandemic following two incredibly difficult school years would only make sense if the district's considered judgment was that these teachers presented more risk or danger to their students than benefit. That's hard for me to believe given my years of experience with these teacher and it, teachers, and it is even harder, but harder to believe given the clear and present danger to students in, in these classes of starting this crucial, challenging school year without qualified teachers in their classrooms. No matter what the superintendent's reasoning is concerning this, the, the, the district has failed in its responsibilities and duty of care towards the school and Mission Hill students. 35 students are now in classrooms that do not meet the district's own requirements for special education. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Avery Salmier de Reyes. Hello. Good evening. My name is Avery Sonia de Reyes. I have been a Mission Hill parent for 15 plus years and I live in Roxbury. Madam Superintendent, my daughter sat on your hiring committee and recommended you to lead the Boston Public Schools because she believed that you had the best interest of her sisters and all children in your heart. The very education that you admired in her her leadership, her questioning of everything in front of her, her ability to conjecture. She learned at Mission Hill School, not from me. As a very young mother, I put my baby into the hands of the teachers that you removed, not only to teach her, but to help me raise her. And they did through a series of damaging decisions, beginning with the move of the school to a building too big and growing the school at the same time to the most recent damaging decisions to remove four excellent teachers who form part of the transformation team you are hurting the chances of all of the children at Mission Hill to receive the same education that was offered to my older daughter. When my middle daughter comes home on the second day of school and cries for an hour in the bathroom because her hero teacher the teacher who made it so easy looking to create a caring community over Zoom for a year was removed. I start to doubt Evelyn's belief in you. I start to doubt her recommendation because my 11 year old daughter doesn't quite understand how her education every day that she spends in that school without a leader and that classroom without a teacher being shuffled from here to there by a substitute. She doesn't quite understand how each day her future is ever so more slightly slipping away from her. As superintendent and as a committee uh, of the Boston Public Schools, you need to understand that. I join the other parents in demanding that you honor in writing our autonomy for the governing board to begin the search for a new leader. I demand that you hire two fully qualified teachers to replace those that you removed. And I demand that special ed requirements be met within one week. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Riyad Labardi, followed by Sherry Kelleher, Cassandra Guthrie, Janice John, and Jennifer Crow. If those speakers could please raise your hand virtually in Zoom, that will help us identify you. Riyad Labardi. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Good evening. My name is Riyad Labardi, and I'm father of two um, children living in Jamaica Plain, a daughter of seven and a half year old being a student at Mission Hill School since K-1 and now in second grade, and a son of three and a half year old going to a family daycare in Jamaica Plain who will hopefully follow the same track of his sister. I was born and raised in France, where my education happened in a public school. I always believe in the public school system and always will, as I think it is an integral part in the education of our children to teach them not only the basics of the learning, 
writing, counting, talking, etc. But also how to interact between each other in a compassionate and kind way, between different communities with a mind open toward the world. This is because of these fundamentals and more that we have picked Mission Hill School for Daughter. Since being at Mission Hill School, our daughter has learned the principle that are the flags of the school culture. And this culture was possible thanks to the autonomous direction of the school for the previous years. However, recent events and changes from Boston Public School made these pillars of the school trembling. And I'm worried. I'm worried as a parent that it is the beginning of a transformation for not saying a destruction that is not what I want for the education and the future of my daughter and hopefully her brother to evolve and grow. Due to the recent events and the potential evolution of the school involving a non-clear and non-transparent Boston Public School lead, this is why, like the other Mission Hill School parents who are speaking tonight, that demand that immediately provide written confirmation to honor the autonomy of the Mission, Mission Hill School Governing Board Authority to begin search and selection of new leadership, meet special education compliance within a week for all students affected by Boston Public School's decision to remove classroom teachers and to hire two highly qualified full-time teachers within one month to replace the ones BPS decided to remove. Please, Please understand that communications, but also comprehension, but also transparency and trust are keys in this difficult time for us, parents, navigating with no visibility. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you and to express my concerns. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Kelleher. Can you hear me now? Yes, good evening. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was hoping the headset would work, but apparently not. Um, thank you all. I appreciate the time to address both the school committee and the superintendent. My name is Sherry Kelleher. I am a Charlestown resident. I have two wonderful boys, one at BLS and one at the Warren Prescott. As we've heard from many other people today, I'm astonished at one level, but not at another, at the continued issues that BPS has with communications. And I really hope that this becomes a true focal point that you'd look to resolve. Time and time again, BPS does a horrendous job of communicating where it's going, what it's done, and how it's arrived at the decisions it's come to. But my bigger concern is, for lack of a better term, the celebration of low expectations. The results for the last year's MCAS, while certainly not as dire as they could be, showed a marked decrease from a not particularly good place to begin with. 30% of third to eighth graders got a meets or higher on English, 20% on math. That's not cause for celebration. It's not really clear to me what BPS plans to do in terms of trying to address learning loss. While I appreciate the mom and apple pie of we've hired tutors, we've got all these plans in place. How does a 24 by seven tutor help a child who doesn't have internet? What are we doing to try and communicate that these tutors are actually gonna be available? How are we going to address learning loss? What are we doing to actually improve the schools so that beyond the three exam schools, we have quality choices for all of our children? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cassandra Guthrie. 
Cassandra will be followed by Janice John, Jennifer Crow, Edith Bazil, Nat Adams, and Elizabeth Pierce. Cassandra? Yes, hi, good evening. Um, I first wanna say thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Um, it, I'm a resident in Dorchester and I have two children going to the Mission Hill School in Jamaica Plain. Um, I didn't hear anyone um, addressing this issue, but I noticed that it's been an issue and it's crossing guards. Um, as I said, I reside in Dorchester and I have um, a crossing guard at the corner of my house and I know the, the job duty of a crossing guard, but I don't see the job actually being done. Um, at the school in Mission Hill and Jamaica Plain, there is no crossing guard. Where there's a small street and school buses are being parked on the sidewalk, there's no way for families and children to walk down the street safely um, to go to the playground or in my predicament, I'm going from the back of the school for one child to the front of the school to get another child and I have no way of walking. Um, there's, there's no type of safety over there. Um, going back to the teacher leaders, um, I actually knew both the teacher leaders from last year. Um, didn't know them personally, but knew them from the last few months that both my children actually was able to attend um, in-person school. And both of them were very wel welcoming and warming. Whereas the teacher leader that we have now, um, I've passed her numerous times and have yet to be introduced. Um, tried to stop to speak to her to introduce myself and it was very difficult. Um, being in a pandemic and the situation that we're in, um, us as parents are looking for not only safety, but also comfort. Um, we're looking for a place for our children to feel safe to go to and for communication to be better. And there's no communication if the te teacher leader herself is not communicating with parents at all. Um, I know I'm, I ran out of time, but I mean, communication needs to be better, safety needs to be better. Um, a, a lot of work needs to be done. And you guys have to start with parents. You know, it, it, these are our children and we're trusting the, the school and the committee to, to help us with the safety. And I don't feel safe at all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janice John. Janice John. Um, hi, um, my name is Janice John and I live in Jamaica Plain. I have three BPS students, all of whom attended Mission Hill. As a parent of a child with uh, significant special needs, I can attest to the depth and breadth of harm that happened to children, many children of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, gender identities, socioeconomic positions and special education needs that happened at the Mission Hill. I want to make sure that the committee here support from within the broader Mission Hill community around the actions of Dr. Casilius and her team. It is right and necessary for BPS to continue to look into what happened at Mission Hill and to understand what failed in order for such significant harm to be perpetuated and not only perpetuated, but protected. An autonomous school that allowed for such egregious harm should not be allowed to be autonomous. I would ask that the school committee and BPS broader community support the superintendent in stepping into the situation to protect some of the most vulnerable children in BPS. Her actions in holding responsible persons accountable is critical to rebuilding the trust of those harmed. I hope that everyone on the committee and community will understand the great cost it is for victims and families to come forward to speak publicly, given how much they have at stake from privacy to re-traumatization to ostracization from the community. You may not hear from many of these families in a public forum. There are far fewer stakes in publicly supporting Mission Hill than in asking for accountability. 
the superintendent's office has made it very clear to the Mission Hill community that these actions are being taken because of serious and longstanding harm being done to children. They enumerated a number of very serious concerns at a well-attended community meeting. And in the face of this, it has been heartbreaking to see the number of Mission Hill families come to the aid of the institution, ignoring the concerns of the victims and supporting the abuser instead. My hope tonight is that anyone in the Mission Hill community who cares about these issues align their concerns and the voices with the children, but delink from the institution of the Mission Hill School. Fight for their rights, their well being, their access to education, but aligning with the institution of the Mission Hill School tends towards silencing many victims and protects the abuser from accountability. Tremendous harm has occurred and truth must come to light. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't see a Jennifer Crow signed into the meeting. Just a friendly reminder, if you can please make sure that you're named in the meeting under the same name that you used to sign up, that will help us identify you when it's your turn to speak. We'll move on to Edith Bazile, followed by Nat Adams, Elizabeth Pierce, Emily Bornerfian, and Elizabeth Cumberpatch. Edith Bazile. Thank you so much. My name is Edith Bazil. We come here to testify month after month, year after year, because as former black students in BPS, we escaped the belly of underachievement. When many of us told, many told us that we were not smart, we couldn't learn and school was not for us. Then we came back at, to BPS as black educators, parents, grandparents to find that not much has changed. Now we see a decline in Black students in BPS as a result of the oppressive structures of anti-Black racism. And instead of addressing them, it is used as an excuse to deprioritize and ignore Black students. Policies continue to hoard resources and strong academic pathways for white and Asian students while leaving Black, Latinx, and students with disabilities behind. Black students are suspended at the highest rate. The newly proposed code of discipline will continue to criminalize and pathologize black students with punitive measures. Why? Because BPS policies pr prioritizes school policing over restorative justice, despite evidence that proves otherwise. The code of conduct mentions restorative justice just once and ignores the racial equity tool. That is akin to pinning a tail on a donkey. McKinley students comprise about 100 students, yet comp comprise the highest rate of DYS commitments, more than another BPS school with a population of over 1,000 students. This code of conduct will continue to gaslight black and brown students into the school to prison pipeline. As educators and advocates, we continue to lend our time, our shared lived experience, our professional expertise and propose explicit solution, yet nothing changes. Well, I am very excited and congratulate this committee on the highly impressive new leaders and congratulate each of them who have joined BPS. For them to be effective, there must be an infrastructure where racial equity centers black and brown students who have been historically marginalized by this system. Finally, BPS must employ black policy makers empowered to apply consequences to those who ignore the racial equity tool in the case of the code of conduct. BPS must prioritize and honor the dignity of black and brown students by implementing a true system uh, with principles of restorative justice that eliminates the racial disparities driven by BPS's racially harmful anti-black student policies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nat Adams. Oh, hi there. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Nat Adams. I live in West Roxbury and I'm a BPS graduate and also a parent. 
Um, I'd like to just briefly build on the committee's comments about the exam school admissions policy status update um, that was, I think, originally supposed to happen tonight. Um, first, I just wanted to note that I think what the committee requested in July wasn't just a general update on how the new policy is being implemented. The superintendent is expected to specifically address the really significant differences between the policy that was ultimately adopted by the committee in July um, and the final proposal of the exam school admissions task force, which had been much more thoroughly explained um, to the public. Uh, the impact of those differences, frankly, should have been known before the new policy was even adopted. And it's disappointing um, that we've now had to wait more than two months to get any of the relevant information around those differences. And then on a similar note, I just wanted to add that a lot of members of the public, I think, are particularly looking forward to this report because we expect that the superintendent will finally make public BPS's simulated admissions results under the new policy. Um, throughout the task force process, BPS routinely and on very short notice produced simulations under various proposals that were considered but ultimately rejected by the task force. So um, it's really just baffling that we still haven't seen any simulations under the policy that the committee actually approved. And I think it will be a tremendous source of frustration for a lot of BPS families if the October 6th update doesn't include those simulations. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Pierce. You can please raise your hand in Zoom, followed by Emily Brunfiend and Elizabeth Cumberbatch. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Pierce. I am a parent at Mission Hill School and I live in Jamaica Plain. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I am speaking with, with concern for the lack of IEP service delivery and lack of notification regarding IEP services following the district's abrupt staffing changes two days into the school year. The district's staffing changes have affected our child and other children at the school through not providing IEP services and simultaneously not notifying families that their children's IEP services have not been delivered amid the district's, district's staffing changes. The district's staffing changes included our child's lead teacher being removed from the classroom, followed by her grade band learning coach being placed as their classroom teacher, thus leaving nobody in the role to deliver the IEP services the learning coach typically delivers, including daily push in and pull out time as designated in our child's IEP. I am concerned for all children in our school impacted by the district's abrupt staffing changes. Through the staffing changes, the district is denying their right to a free and appropriate public education. In the absence of appropriate delivery of IEP services, our child cannot appropriately access the curriculum and the district is out of compliance. The district must rectify this by immediately making appropriate staffing assignments to include those designated and qualified to deliver IEP services, as well as addressing the missed services. I am particularly concerned for the families unaware of the lack of IEP services presently, and I thank you for your attention to this important issue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily Bounerfeen. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Oh, oh. we can no longer hear you. Please try again. I'm so sorry about this. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Can 
you hear me? We're fine. Please continue. Okay, I'm going to speak, but I, I can't hear anyone right now because of um, technical difficulties. Um, and so I'm just going to um, introduce myself. My name is Emily Bauer and find I live in Jamaica Plain and I'm speaking tonight as a concerned parent of a fifth grader at the Mission Hill School. Um, we've been proud members of the Boston public school system for six years now and that's because of our experience with the Mission Hill schools consistently supportive learning environment but BPS is Recent, recent actions have betrayed our family's trust in this system. Uh, on the second day of school, my daughter's much beloved teacher was given notice in front of her that she was being put on leave. And this action was taken without first lining up substitutes and without alerting parents to this disruption until the end of the day on Monday. And these actions, and in particular, the timing of these actions, point to a disregard for the emotional well-being and the education of the students at, at the school right now, as well as a fundamental disregard for the unique community at Mission Hill. So if your goal is to create a safe and supportive environment, as you've mentioned in your presentation, Superintendent, yes, give the teachers the training they need to handle challenging disciplinary situations. I wholly support any opportunities that can help our teachers better support and protect vulnerable students and my heart breaks for our friends and families that have suffered in the past, but the actions right now are undercutting vulnerable students at the school presently. So I join the Mission Hill community and echo their demands to support students at the school now. So please honor the autonomy of the Mission Hill School Governing Board's authority to search and select our new leaders and help our community grow and heal. My meet special education compliance for all students affected by these decisions to remove classroom teachers. And if the teachers cannot be reinstated, hire two highly qualified full-time teachers within one month to replace the ones BPS decided to remove. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm sorry that um, I have for my technical difficulties and I know it's been a long meeting, so I'm, I'm really grateful for your patience with me. Thank you very much, we appreciate that. Our final speaker this evening is Elizabeth Cumberbatch. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cumberbatch. I live in Jamaica Plain. I'm also a Mission Hill parent and um, a product of Boston Public Schools. Um, in the interest, of time, I'm not gonna repeat anything anyone else has said, but um, you understand the situation at Mission Hill. Right now we're in a moment of change and our family's assertion is this is an opportunity for, to find creative solutions that are efficient, but also reflective of our community. We need to put the safety and educational needs of our children first, particularly the most vulnerable populations in our school. To that end, we're asking for the hiring of qualified staff in a timely manner who will uphold our school's mission and make a positive impact in our community. Also, it's vital that our students see representation of themselves in their teachers. And we ask that BPS ensure that the abundant pool of qualified teachers and leaders of color are considered for these roles as they are filled. To echo many others tonight, we also ask for improved communication between BPS families and teachers. And we must be sure we're meeting the IEP needs of all of the students in our inclusion community. We need to deliver current IEP services, be sure we have appropriate, appropriate ratios within each of our classrooms and write IEPs for any students in the school who still need them. Above all, it's our responsibility as the adults to support students. That's, that's what it comes down to, that's our job. We hope that we can move forward in a better direction as a community and as a city school. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Chair Robinson, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you to those of you who spoke this evening and shared your perspectives. Your testimony is very important to us. 
Our first action item this evening is grants for approval totaling $1,494,075. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Anyone have any questions? Comments. Um, I have two quick comments. One is about innovation pathways, um, the planning grant. And I guess I'm, I, my question is, is innovation pathways similar to a magnet school kind of, you know, presentation? What, what are they, um, what types of programs will be tried out in this innovation pathways program? Because it didn't talk about the content as much, very much. I think Nate Cooter is on the call and can speak to the grants and the specifics within them other than the details that were given to you, but most of them are in our secondary schools and they are career pathway programs. And they'll be using uh, this funding for innovation pathways, meaning uh, more of the career uh, programs at each of the different schools, more vocational type uh, programs. And I don't know if you have anything more to add, uh, Mr. Cooter. Uh, no, uh, Superintendent, thank you. If, it, if they're more specific, I can follow up with the grant, um, the, the different schools to find out. The, the plan is for uh, additional um, programming for students who are currently at the school. So in terms of a magnet program, as you know, all our schools are already citywide. So it, it's, um, it's not intended for that purpose, my understanding. All right, thank you. My other question is about the homeless grant. And at some point, can we get an update on how the given out of the thousand vouchers that were given out during COVID, how those families are faring? It seems like this grant is similar, that it will provide additional supports and would love to understand what has happened in the, in the previous grant. So that's not something for tonight, but um, if you can give us that update in the future. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, One sorry. other thing, uh, Ms. Robinson, I know that you've asked, the committee has asked for um, more of a deeper look into grants. The, the finance team is still looking at um, doing that. And so we, we are still preparing to bring forward um, more around the equity of the grants and how they're going out to schools and that sort of thing. So um, we'll hopefully have a handle on that um, in the future for a future meeting. All righty, thank you. Dean Coleman. Sorry, I was giving a thumbs up to the superintendent oh. proposal for okay. uh, doing that feature. Okay. If there are no other questions, um, uh, I'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve the grants as presented. I hear a motion. So Thank you. Is there a second? second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Rujo? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Agreed. Our next action. All righty, thank you. Sorry. Our next action item this evening is the collective bargain, bargaining agreement between the Boston School Committee and the Boston Teachers Union regarding health and safety for the school year 2021 22, which the committee received a presentation on earlier this evening. I'll now invite the superintendent to give any final comments. Can't, you're, you're muted, Superintendent. I'm sorry, Ms. Robinson, I didn't hear you. Can you please well, repeat? Yeah, any final comments on the um, collective bargaining agreement? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't have any at this time. Okay, thank you. I'll open it up to the committee for any final comments. No, everybody's okay. If there are no comments, I'll entertain a motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement between the Boston Teach School Committee and the Boston Teachers Union regarding health and safety for the school year 2021 to 2022 as presented. Do you have a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you. Any question or objection to the, to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Ruggio? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Our next action item is the acceptance of the district's fiscal 22 elementary and secondary school emergency relief ESSER funding implementation plan. You'll recall that the superintendent and her ESSER team, led by Chief of Accountability Eva Mitchell, have presented several ESSER updates to the school committee as recently as September 1st. I'll now invite the superintendent to give any final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, with the ESSER funding, we are um, going to be able to respond to our MCAS results. We will be able to respond to the health and safety of our students and the social emotional well being of our entire community, uh, teachers and students and everybody. Um, and so these funds are extremely important. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for Ms. Mitchell and her work. Uh, to convene multiple groups of stakeholders and um, excited to be able to move forward with uh, this funding. Thank you, Superintendent. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Ms. LaPera. Thank you, Chair Robinson. Um, the only um, comments I, I really have is appreciate the, the enormous amount of work that's um, been undertaken to put this plan together. Um, I think it would be helpful for uh, us and also the public to understand generally what investments look like in particular buckets um, and how they are being enhanced with ESSER versus uh, perhaps moving um, general operating money around. Uh, so I, it would just be helpful to get like a full understanding of uh, what total investments look like with the addition of ESSER in particular buckets of priorities. Um, so that's just a, um, a recommendation that I have. Uh, and then the other piece is um, as a committee member, it would be helpful for me to see progress reports um, with where we're, where we're making investments, how we're seeing um, improvement or opportunities um, enhanced for students uh, throughout the year and throughout the usage of these ESSER funds. Um, so those are the, the two pieces that I'd add. Yeah, thank you, Ms. LaParrot. We plan on doing uh, updates, regular updates to the school committee on the use of the funding. Um, and also because we're hoping to spread it out over multiple years. So that means that we need to continue to come back to the committee when we expend new funding. Um, and I have uh, Mr. Cooter here who can talk to you about the big buckets of the investments that are in ESSER 2 and maybe give just a short highlight of where we're headed for ESSER 3 um, as we move forward with these one-time funding to be able to you know, recover um, and uh, put in place a great start to the work that we wanna do in the next FY22 budget, um, which we're gonna be working on pretty soon here. And I want uh, everyone to be able to see how this funding can help build toward a more equitable opportunity for students with the operational funding as well that we're gonna be uh, voting on here in the next several months. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent. Um, I, I would just add a few things. I think um, when we started our FY22 planning process last uh, January, February, and started our public conversation, we highlighted some of the areas where there was a complement of our FY22 operating investments and those investments that we planned um, to move on to ESSER funding. At that time, we were just starting to get a sense of what the size and scope of investments were, were going to be in the size and the scope of ESSER parts two and part three. Um, of course, since that time, we've had many public conversations led by um, Ava Mitchell and her team. Um, and so as the superintendent mentioned, we're about to begin the process of FY23 planning where we will come back with um, how the ESSER funding parts two and part three are complements to 
uh, both our operating budget investments and our capital budget investments. So these are three different funding sources, all meant to pull in the same direction and achieve our goal of providing a high quality educational experience for all students. You're gonna start hearing a lot more about the superintendent's foundation for quality and equality guarantee. Um, those things that she wants to see present at all schools. Um, we've started to see conversations around expectations for Mass Corps, um, expectations for um, social workers and school psychologists at every school. Um, and in, in some of the presentations tonight and going into the fall, you're gonna hear about our academic vision and how all of these things complement. So Ms. LaPere, I appreciate you raising the, the um, request for and sort of the question about um, how do we play or put all of these different pieces um, in the same picture for the community so they can see our total investments um, ha and how it reaches our, our goal. And I think Charles Granson, Dr. Granson and his team are working a lot on the strategic plan and our measurable goals. That's a compliment again to the work that Ava Mitchell's team is doing to make sure that we're we're holding ourselves highly accountable for all of the, all of the dollars spent um, and not just saying what we spent it on but what that accomplished for our students and what goals we were able to meet so it's a lot um, it's a huge opportunity but again we owe it to the community to be able to really put those pieces um, in place so that we can paint the full picture of how our resources are going to meet the needs of our students thank you other questions or comments? I have one question. I don't, I'm not sure if you can pull up slide number 11 from the presentation that was um, on Esther that was included with our um, materials. Nate, are you able to um, pull up your screen? Oh, you want me to share it? Um, yeah, if you can share that slide. I was really, I was particularly struck by that slide and the information that it, it contained and just wanted to um, raise an issue. And Miss Mitchell wasn't feeling this uh, well this okay. uh, evening. So I just, you know, she would have been here as no. well. I just want to acknowledge her uh, work on this. Steve, 30 more seconds and I should be with you with the slide. I apologize. Okay, more. thank you. And slide 11 that you're referring to is the one on the engagement timeline moving forward? No, it's got a list of all of the investments. Ah. Do you see the one I mean? I believe this is the slide you're referring to? Yes. Um, when I looked at that slide, you know, I, I recognizing the ESSER money is only here for three years and looking at that list of investments. And I guess my question is, how do we build so that we don't lose these investments after the three years? Because this begins to look like what our school should look like all of the time in terms of the kinds of investments that are all listed here. And so that's my biggest question. How do we not lose sight of all of what this slide is telling us as we move through ESSER and beyond? Yeah, these are um, the items that are under review right now for ESSER 3. These are the items that we heard most often from our public on the things that they wanted us to include and in how to spend the funding for ESSER 3. And so we are still reviewing and um, hoping to do many of these things. I can tell you that before and after care was uh, one of the top requests from our parents. Expanding libraries was another piece of our support in our uh, academic vision and strategic plan around increasing access uh, across our district to rich text and um, equitable literacy as we focus. Obviously, we've already committed capital funding to HVAC systems, as well as some ESSER II funding uh, for HVAC systems. Um, this is 
uh, really the uh, temporary air conditioning that we have until we get to the real um, work of um, capital build outs of HVAC systems in our schools, um, athletics, um, mass core implementation. Those are things that you will see also uh, built in bilingual education and bilingual investments. Um, by literacy and our EL path forward planning that we are trying to finalize with our broader stakeholder group. And then all of the recovery work that we're doing uh, with tutoring and support systems, um, added staffing and paraprofessionals that I shared with you earlier in our staffing report. Uh, and then of course, supports for our um, special needs students. And so those part of this will be early investments in ESSER, but will be built into our future operational budgets uh, as we are thinking both about, you know, launching, for instance, expanded athletics and buying equipment or buying new collections for libraries, but then the funding that we need to pay for coaches or pay for librarians might come in and later uh, operational budget. So that's how we're thinking about it. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Nate. No, I think you covered it really well. I would just say, I think for each of these, we're also thinking about what are the, what are, what are the sort of deferred maintenance or deferred investments um, that we've, we need to catch up on. Um, so when we think about our arts and athletics, there's materials and resources that are needed. Those are, those are investments and in, in that outlast any single year's uh, investments, right? So when we make a curricular purchase, the curricular materials that we're getting access to um, are a multi-year use, um, but then also the professional development and the support for teachers in changing their practice. Those are things that outlast um, any investment. So it's, it's both uh, in any given category, it may seem like we're taking on large sort of ongoing costs. And as the superintendent mentioned, at times we're doing that in anticipation of, of our FY23 investments. But then in other cases, the ESSER funding is meant to be a complement of the operating investments that we will or have already made to make sure that we have high quality resources, high quality learning environments, and the, the tools and um, sort of equipment that are needed to support our program and the expectation for all students. I also just want to add um, that, you know, um, oh shoot, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Um, oh, we're in a different position than many of our other um, school districts across the nation because of the 100 million three year commitment. That puts us in a very different position to be able to think about this funding um, than some of my colleagues across the uh, nation. So we're very thankful to our, um, our mayors and our city council. Um, and all of you for passing budgets and being supportive uh, of the operational budgets that we've been passing and, and the, all of the investments we've been making over the past two years and now this last year of that $100 million commitment. Thank you. No, I just felt that seeing this gave us that North Star of remembering what it is that we wanna make sure our students have access to all the time, not just in these next three years. And I guess my ultimate question is, what do high performing well-resourced districts do that we don't do? And that should be where we're heading as well. As I've said many times, you know, this is what Boston deserves all the time. And we've got to really work towards making sure these things actually do happen for all of our students. Thank you. So if there are no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to accept the FY22 L elementary and secondary school emergency relief ESSER funding implementation as presented. So moved. Is there a motion? Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there a second? Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Mr. O'Neill. Yeah, Chair Robinson, I do not have a objection to the motion. I do want to continue to express the caution that um, we, and I know we've been talking about this throughout, um, that we continue to focus our spending on ways that do not leave us in a negative position uh, three years out. Um, and I, I know that that has uh, been incorporated in these recommendations. 
I appreciate the work the superintendent and the team did to keep this on a separate process, to have a community engagement process on it, and uh, to continue to report on this differently um, as has already been discussed, and look forward to the recommendations for ESSA 3, um, which I hope is particularly focused on reimagine. And, um, but we have to continue to be cautious that this is one time um, funding from the federal government and we have to resist every temptation, particularly in guidance we give to school leaders. We have to resist temptation to use it as stopgap funding that kicks the can down the road a couple of years later. I agree a hundred percent with what the superintendent said that hundred year, hundred million dollar commitment um, from a past mayor and current mayor and hopefully uh, a future mayor will continue it and the city council as well has been instrumental. It's money like that that's allowing us to do the social work as the family engagement, the guidance counselors, the school nurses, all the social emotional support separate from this ESSA funding. But I just wanna make sure every time we talk about this ESSA funding, funding, we are careful to highlight that we cannot rely on this for regular day-to-day -day spending. Yeah. Agreed. So, shall I go back again? Um, uh, Madam Chair, just one question. Just Mr. No mentioned okay. the reporting. Okay. Sorry. Um, and just uh, for, for going forward, I think we had asked for uh, a school by school breakdown of uh, and where the resources are going. So, kind of categorize it that way. And just hoping that we can see that um, at, a, um, uh, at the next okay. future meeting. Thank you. Yes. Mr. O'Neill, did you have something else? No, I believe we actually did receive, Mr. Kuda, you did send that out. Oh, I'm sorry. The school allocations. I'm sorry, Mr. DeRouge, it, it may have been missed in a, I, I believe it was sent out um, okay. to all members a, a bit earlier this week. We can, we can correct that for you, sir. Yeah, the school allocation, then also going forward, we'll be able to report out, you know, um, part of the accept and expand that happens, we load, each of these grants into our financial system and they become part of our monthly budget updates um, to the school committee. We'll be coming back in December with our first FY22 projections um, to give you a sense of where we're going. Um, that'll be our first chance to start showing you what our reporting on SR can look like from a, um, an expenditure perspective, not just on this sort of strategy piece, but we certainly will be able to, to share with you um, a regular reports on um, sort of projected expended and uh, expending and current expenses on, on that grant. Hey, Mr. DiRusso, I apologize for my uncertainty on that because I know I had asked that question at the last meeting. So we got it the other day, but I have to go back to see if it, I assume it had been sent to all members, but you may not have caught it. I, it may have just been sent to me in answer to that question. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I'll follow up. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. LaPera. Thank you, um, Chair Robinson. But I think to Mr. DeRugio's point, um, while we did receive the um, school allocation, I know that we are also centralizing some costs and services. And so I would be interested in understanding how that touches every single school um, because it might not necessarily engage with every single school if it's opt-in. And so as things are being implemented, I would be curious to see how investments that are centralized um, interact with uh, supports for individual schools. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, so I'll start again. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. DeRugio? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Our final action item this e evening is the acceptance of the school year 2021-2022 mask and COVID testing policy. 
You'll recall that the superintendent presented this policy to the committee as part of her superintendent's report at our September 1st meeting. The policy states that all BPS students and staff, regardless of vaccination status, will be required to wear masks while inside school buildings during yellow school bus transportation and when attending school or watching athletic events. I'll now invite the superintendent to give any final comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. We just thought it prudent to bring it forward to school committee. Um, you know, we had followed the city and decided to do vaccines and also uh, for our staff and also do COVID testing for our students and our staff and, and then masking. And we just thought it was important to be able to um, have school committee approval on these matters. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I read the wrong page and, did, and, and left out part of what the policy is. So I want to re, re, read the rest of the policy. If students are in violation of the policy, the school leader will consult with the parent, guardians, health services, and or office of special education in order to ensure compliance and the student's code of conduct will be applied if appropriate to the situation. Violations of this policy by staff will be handled in the same manner as other violations of Boston public school policies. As for testing, all students will have access to free and voluntary COVID-19 pool testing. Regardless of vaccination status, we encourage everyone to participate. Parents must consent to this testing. So any other? No, okay. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Mr. De Arugia. Um, I'll just say, you know, in support of this and important for us, I think as an institution uh, to come out in, in, in support of these policies, even if the city and, you know, overlapping um, uh, jurisdictions have, are requiring it, uh, but important to go on record and support of these policies. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. O'Neill? I echo Mr. DiRugio's comments. I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's necessary since at this point it is actually mandated by DESI, but I, I agree that it is important that we publicly show support um, for these policies. I will also say that, you know, in the past week, I think I've been in every grade between K-1 and, and um, 12th grade. And I was astonished, pleasantly surprised um, by how our students are adapting and uh, wearing masks. It was interesting one parent talking today about you know the child having pain behind the ears. Um, and I admit that happens to me too when I wear a mask for long periods. Um, but uh, you know the amount of support that I've seen in the schools and um, both from the teachers and the staff was very encouraging. And this is the best thing for all of us. This is what the science says. And so uh, fully supportive. Thank you. Anyone else? I hope for the students like the young man that was having problem with his masks, there are little things that you can create with buttons, et cetera, that pull it. So I'm hoping that the schools or the school nurses will look into some of these small adaptive devices that can make mask wearing a little bit more comfortable for some of our students, so. Any further questions? If there are no further questions, I will entertain a motion to accept the school year 2021-2022 mask and COVID testing policy as presented. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, please call the roll. Dr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. De Arugio? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Our first report this evening is an update to the code of conduct. At this time, I'd like to invite Daisha Campbell, Assistant Superintendent, Division of Schools, to please present her report. 
First, I'd like to invite the superintendent to provide opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the Code of Conduct is a really important document that guides our work with students. Um, there are some important changes that are being made. It has been revised previously uh, over multiple years, and we just continue to take a sharp anti-racist lens to the Code of Conduct. Um, and uh, Ms. Campbell has worked many months uh, with stakeholders on this policy and with our educators and our school leaders. Um, and so um, I'm happy that she's able to present this today. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Caselius, Chair Robinson, school committee members and members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity to present the 2021 code. I'm actually going to be joined by Jody Elgie, Senior Director of Succeed Boston, um, and former uh, Code of Conduct Chair Sam DePina for Q&A. Next slide. This slide reflects the Code of Conduct uh, BPS team's um, goals and our purpose. Um, our goal is focused on personal growth and the development of our students. And, our and with our purpose, we wanted the code to be a resource that supports schools to build a more connected relationship with students. Next slide. We thought it was also important to provide some background um, as it relates to previous revisions of the code. Um, in 2010, it was decided that every uh, couple years um, that we would uh, determine if we would look at the code to see if any revisions would be made. Um, in 2010, uh, COCACA, the Code of Conduct Advisory Council was formed. Also, um, some important additions to the code relating to bullying, cyberbullying, and restorative justice uh, as an alternative to suspensions was included in 2013. Some important due process uh, additions uh, as it related to the new law of Chapter 222 um, were added to the code. In 2016, which was the, uh, the last version before this one, uh, we made some adjustments as it related to social emotional learning. So this slide, we talk about why we made the, the updates to the code of conduct. Um, initially, it was relating to stakeholder feedback. Um, more importantly, also too, that uh, we also wanted to align the code with Boston Public Schools strategic plan, and also um, a settlement agreement that we had signed in 2017 uh, that lays out some of these, um, these terms. We found that to be good practice. Um, and although the settlement agreement was um, ending, we decided to adopt it into the code. Next slide. During the this uh, code revision, I will talk about a little bit more. And it started in actually school year 2000. 18, 2019. Um, so during the pandemic, the Code of Conduct team really took a pause and reread the code um, and really did it with an anti-racist lens. Um, and we started to incorporate these, uh, these action items here, the two, three, four, and five. Um, and we really started to focus on what was the adult work that needed to happen um, in order to welcome our students back and to make sure that we're not, you know, revising a code where it's about um, fixing students or making students do more. And so next slide. So Jody is just going to speak a little bit about um, the Massachusetts multi-tiered systems of support and the adult work that needs to occur to ensure safe and welcoming equitable classrooms. Oops. Next slide. Yeah, didn't move, I apologize. <laughs> so what we did is we, we reformatted the code, the MTSS framework to, to more effectively focus on promotion and prevention. And what, what we determined is that we had in past codes, we had looked much more at, at intervention. And we, we decided to reword the code and really prioritize it so that we were looking at a clear design for teachers and other staff 
that allows for school-wide support to students based on their individual needs. So tier one is where most of the work occurs in building communities where all students feel a sense of belonging, feel welcomed and their voices are valued. 80% of the work done in schools is done in tier one and 80% of students are able to meet their academic goals, their social, emotional and physical development through whole school class skill building, prevention work, using culturally and linguistically sustaining practices and providing whole school prevention work specifically around bullying prevention, social emotional skill building, conflict resolution, healthy relationships and or restorative circles. Tier two is, um, is, is the second tier of the MTSS structure, which targets about 15% of students and that, those small groups of students get everything that's also included in tier one and more individualized support and skill building, which is necessary for them to continue to make progress. Some examples might be lunch groups, social skills groups, mentorings, mentoring attendance plans, and uh, participation in Succeed Boston voluntary workshops. Tier three of the MTSS structure. Once again, students receive all of the services in tier one and tier two, but in addition to that, they also receive individualized services like one-on-one -on -one counseling, functional behavioral assessments, behavioral intervention plans. And it's important to note that tier three does not mean an automatic referral to special education. When we looked at the impact of the code and, and the revisions and the clarification of the MTSS model, we saw that it really did extend across the school and builds upon the partnership with families through clarification of supports available and increased measures for accountability and promotion of the rights of students, parents, guardians, and caregivers. Jody, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about, just quickly about um, on slide seven, about yep. um, the tiered instruction. During the pandemic, um, we, Jody and I, the Code of Conduct um, and Operational Lead have partnered with uh, Succeed Boston and focused a lot on tier one in terms of uh, providing training on restorative practice um, for school leaders. Because, you know, although the Code of Conduct did apply, Virtually, we did not want students to be, um, be affected in terms of losing um, time for disciplinary issues online. So we really refocused to make sure that we were fortifying our teachers um, with uh, tier one supports and restorative practices. And what does that look like? And what does that look like online? There was pretty much training every week coming from Succeed Boston or being offered by Succeed Boston. Uh, throughout um, the time that we were in remote learning. Sorry, Jody, you can go on to slide oh, nine. Thank you, Dacia. Slide nine, this slide reflects the stakeholders um, that uh, gave input and feedback into the, uh, the revised code of conduct. Um, in the spring of 2019, Mr. DePina held about 10 feedback sessions with stakeholders, um, including uh, the folks that you see here in COCAC. Um, it should be noted that the Code of Conduct Advisory Council uh, I've met with, we've met with several times and we've had three re revised drafts. Um, you know, we did not reach consensus with all stakeholders, but where we could, we did. Um, we, you know, places uh, where we differed really were about philosophical um, changes, not necessarily about the content change. Um, so I will just talk about the racial equity toolkit. We, um, we also engage the end users in the code and then the racial equity planning tool by using the steps of the tool as a guiding roadmap through the process, specifically as it relates to the Code of Conduct Advisory Council. We began the process of using the racial equity tool with the stakeholders and COCAC and COCAC pushed us to engage in a deeper level of reflection around the use of the tool which would require more time for us to work together. 
to come to a consensus. We commit to using the tool from the beginning of the process as we continue to partner with the Division of Equity and Strategy on ensuring that all components of the code have a racial equity analysis. Next slide. So just briefly, um, these are within the code, these are the superintendent circulars that uh, overlap or align with the code. Um, for this particular new code, they're all linked in um, for the reader. Um, and this is now a searchable document. Um, one of the things that we felt was very important is in, since 2010, the statement um, ha of bullying um, has been in the code. It's buried down. Um, just given the landscape, we did uh, call it forward and bring it up. Um, and I just think it's important to note that, you know, it's not just about um, reporting bullying. It's about also making sure that we're partnering with Succeed Boston and giving educational training. Um, so we just, we just called it out into the student section just to make it a little bit more prominent. Next slide, Jody. Yep, sorry, it sometimes doesn't quite move. Oh, there we go. So the next slides that I will go into, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, the data. Um, so the next few ones will relate to selected populations, days missed due to suspension, and um, offenses resulting in suspension. As you can see, Boston is one of the largest school districts um, around, but our suspension rates um, are have gone down and, and comparable to other districts. Um, we're lower, a um, little above the state average. Next slide. And this is our seven year um, suspension um, rate. And you can see it's, it seems like it's trending down. Um, next slide, Jody. Some concerns is that although um, the suspension rates are trending down, they're still high or disproportionately high for African-American, Black, Latinx students um, and students with disabilities are not represented here, but it's still high for those particular students. This is a slide that reflects that. So by the selected populations, you will see the students with disabilities, um, believe that's male students and economically uh, disadvantaged students are still a little high. We're trending down, but they're higher than female um, English learners. Um, so that is something that we're, we're planning to work on and I'll speak to how we intend to address that. Next slide. So this was also a, just an important piece of data that we wanted to include that showed um, days missed due to suspension for students. Um, it seems that according to the chart that the average student is missing about two to three days um, as it relates to a, uh, a, a suspension. Next slide, Jody. And so also we just wanted to illustrate some of the offenses resulting in suspension. Um, by these categories. Um, so non-drug, non-violent, non-criminal offenses um, could be uh, repeated uh, bullying, I believe, I'm sorry, retaliation to bullying. It could also be disruption. Oh, it's actually listed here now, thank you. So violations of school rules. So that's what it's related to. Might not be clear, I just wanted to call that out. So some of the next steps that are relating to the code of conduct are, are outlined here. But um, one of the things that I will want the team to be focused on, uh, all of them, but specifically number two, in terms of training to focus on root causes, root cause analysis of why black and Latin students, Latinx students and students with disabilities experience disproportional discipline. Um, some of this work has already started in another committee. We started to do um, looking at data we want this to continue. And I think one of the ways that we can continue is during the training, that we can hold some workshops to, to, get, to, to, to get to the why um, so that we can you know, figure out or, unc or uncover what are some of the underlining or systemic causes for this disproportionality um, and to really put an actionable plan in place to address it as our suspensions trend down. Sorry. 
Okay, and so um, there's just, as I you know, conclude, um, I do want to, I do believe that we um, submitted a copy of the code of conduct. Um, we intend to make two amendments to the draft, um, one of which is it relates to um, sections 6.2.3. Um, after we reviewed it, uh, while it was never in our intention to use field trips for graded assignments as an alternative to suspensions, we now see that it has led to some confusion. So we intend to revise the language um, and the language is related to the ex exception language um, and the new language will read, a student may not be excluded from a field trip that is required for teaching, learning and or will result in a graded assignment. And that language is actually reflected earlier in the document on page five, number five, but we wanted to ensure that the reader understood. The additional, um, revision that we're gonna make is that we will be taking out any references to school police from the document. That concludes my report. Um, thank you, thank you Ms. Campbell um, and Jody and the rest of the team for the support. The only thing I would like to add um, that I wanna make sure we highlight is one of the big purposes of this revision was to also make this a shorter, more family friendly document to use. So you'll see that it's um, very much abbreviated from previous versions. And what we've also done was um, removed a lot of the procedural um, guidance that was in the code and moved that to a to Superintendent Circular 5, which is more of a procedural um, um, uh, circular that we created a few years back. So we, we're going to increase the size of that procedural circular for training purposes and guidance and really condense the code to be family friendly and, and, and user friendly. Thank you, Daisy and team. With that, we'll turn it back over to Madam Chair. Um, and if, the, if, if you know, there's any questions you can oh, ask. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, for, I forgot to unmute, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Um, were there any, okay, I'll now open it up to um, the committee for questions and comments. Ms. Mercer. Hello, so um, thank you for the presentation. And my first question is, um, who are the team members on the Code of Conduct Advisory Council? I can supplement that information. Um, I do have uh, it in a slide, so I can definitely um, submit that to Ms. Sullivan so you can see the team members. Thank you. Um, another question I have is, how is the race data measured if a student identifies with um, more than one race? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. How is the race data measured if a student identifies with more than one race? Is Ms. Hogan um, available? I know that she was on hand to talk a little bit more deeply about the data and how it's captured. Hi, Daisia. Um, that's a great question, Ms. Mercer. Um, so when students register for um, school and BPS, they um, answer two questions. Um, yes, no, are you Hispanic or Latino? And then a question where you can check multiple um, boxes for different race categories. Um, and the way that DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, reports that information is if students have checked off um, multiple race boxes and answered no to the Hispanic Latino question, they would be captured as multi-race. Um, I can, I can double check the numbers, but I believe um, most of the suspension data for multi-race students is actually suppressed because of how few students it is. But we can certainly follow up on that for you. Thank you. Um, another question I have is why are suspension rates high among students with disabilities nearly twice? Sorry, why are um, suspension rates twice as high among students with disabilities compared to other groups? That is something that we're working to figure out. Um, you know, in another committee, when I looked at it, I could only hypothesize at that particular time um, by looking to see if we were doing things in terms of figuring out what triggers were um, and not suspending students for things that might be related. Um, so I, I, at this point, I would be hypothesizing that that is why I wanna do a deeper root cause analysis with a team of people so that we can 
we can come to some conclusions. Um, my other question is, is the Code of Conduct Advisory Council working on trying to lower the historically high suspension rates among people of color, more, more specifically Black and Latino X, Latino X um, communities among with students with disabilities? Yes, that is exactly what we're focused on. I will, we will be focused on, you know, we're, although we're happy that the suspension rates are going down, I can't celebrate um, if it's not really, you know, going down for all, um, for our most marginalized groups. So we look forward to partnering with BSAC as we have been um, before um, to get your best thinking on this. So um, I believe you guys had spoken about some kind of training um, along with the code of conduct. So would that training include anti-racist or bias training? Yes, I think um, that, is, that is, thank you for that question. That is the plan. Um, I don't think that I can do the work um, without partnering with the Office of um, Equity. We have been in some preliminary talks in terms of um, some suggestions have been made, um, so, but yes. And then the only thing I would add to that is that if you notice in the code, we did remove some civil rights violation language and included bias-based conduct instead. So that was one of the key differences that we flagged um, during this analysis. So a lot more of that um, work and training will be rolled out. Um, I have one more question. Oh, well, technically two, but if time permits, one. Um, why is there an option to suspend students for more than eight days? Could you say that again? Just Why is there an option to suspend students for more than eight days? I believe that might be the option that might be leading um, to expulsion. And depending on the severity of the, of, of the offense, right? Because we have short-term suspensions and long-term suspensions. So long -term, yeah. the severity of the offense um, um, may also dictate and come into play for that. But regardless, I just want to remind everyone that regardless of the length of suspension, the district is obligated to provide uh, students with an opportunity to um, make academic progress and gains. And we have to come up with an academic plan for any student who's suspended um, for any amount of time. Thank you, Mr. Depena. That is one of the um, the changes that 222, Chapter 222 made. Ms. Mercer, I just wanted to say you, you're asking really great questions. And um, I don't know what your role is in terms of BSAC, but it would be really wonderful to have you participate in our um, Code of Conduct Committee, because I think you, you've raised some really important issues. And, and one of them that Ms. Campbell talked about is thinking about how adults talk to students. And um, when Ms. Campbell talked about triggers, that's one of the things that, mm. that we want to hear from students about is their own experiences in the classroom and things that have been problematic for them. And um, I can just tell you that from Succeed Boston, where students go not only when they've been suspended, but if they've, if they've had any sort of an issue, um, where they need some support, sometimes kids will say to me, miss, what would you do? What would you do, miss, in a situation like that? So we're really aware that we need to do a lot of work with, with adults. And I think to Ms. Mm -hmm. Campbell's point, that really is the focus on the tier one support that we're offering. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Mercer. Thank you. Mr. De Arugia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a comment and a question. A comment actually that um, just to pick up on what Mr. DePina said at the end, um, just kind of going through this, the, um, the hope that there's a focus on being able to uh, wrestle with this with families, uh, communicate it in a way that's understandable. That this is a, you know, a compact. This is um, you know, part of uh, the fabric of, of, of being part of the school system and making it as understandable to the, to the range of families, some that you know, have no experience with you know, a Western style school system or anything, you know, sophisticated uh, and varying degrees of, you know, language knowledge and so forth. So um, a really, really important point, I think, at the end on that. Um, and then this is an area of policy that I'm actually not very familiar with, but um, I have picked up on uh, both uh, on public comment, both written uh, and oral folks highlighting the restorative justice, justice piece. And I saw, um, you know, some focus on that. Um, I'll just be interested as I, I'll, I'll, you know, as I dig in this, into this as well, that um, that we are relying on um, our, in our latest understanding of, of how to um, you know, build a society that we want to build and learning from past experience of what you know, clearly hasn't worked. Um, 
and uh, and then implement those policies that uh, that you know that, that build a culture uh, that that we want in the school system. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Thank you. Um, this is very exciting work, um, and and. Uh, Great to see the progress going forward, and I just want to lift up and and and, and uh, align with what Ms. Mercer and, uh, has suggested, is that um, having more clarity on what the teacher training piece is, because a lot of the escalations happen there, and the, mm -hmm. the, the research on this is you know really powerful um, in terms of of that approach and what we're doing with teachers to help them with that work. Um, the other question I had that wasn't completely. Uh, um, uh, transparent for me. So I think the the structuring it around the uh, multi-tier support system is just brilliant and wonderful, a huge movement forward in the field, just uh, so important for us to see. I wasn't sure, I didn't pick up where the, where the um, structured restorative justice piece is. So there's one thing to identify, um, you know, a child um, does something that needs a response to one, to two, to three. I didn't see, and, I, and if, I, if I missed it, just tell me where I should go read again, where the piece where they have to spend time thinking about how they rejoin the community of care. So I think that's gonna be very critical. I think that's a critical part of any system of sort of justice that there'd be structured ways that they, 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 they recommit to the community and the community can recommit to them. In, in addition to they're getting support to develop the skills that they can be more effective, where do they kind of have that um, um, moment where they get to rejoin the community and recommit two ways? Um, I can answer that question or attempt to anyway, Dr. Coleman. Um, one of the things that we do is we do um, re-entry plans for students when they do go back to school, and that is a restorative process. Um, and it is, it's a collaborative process that includes the student, the family, the, the school, and also, for instance, if they were to serve a suspension at Succeed Boston, it would include a, a clinician from Succeed Boston also. And, and um, that is part of any sort of return for a student. We are, mm -hmm. we are recommending that um, to student support teams as well. So anytime a student is absent from school for a long period of time, it doesn't just have to be a discipline issue. It may be that they were hospitalized. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we welcome students back and we do that wholly um, to include the family and the student in the return plan. So it isn't but particularly spelled out Restorative justice in particular is not spelled out, but the restorative, the use of a restorative practice mm -hmm. in returning is used in other parts of the code. And are there similar opportunities at tier one and tier two, or is that just a tier three process? No, absolutely. So tier okay. one would be, it's really about community building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, as, as Daisy has said, Ms. Campbell said, we spent a lot of time, Succeed Boston, during the closure, offering trainings, restorative justice trainings for school leaders, for school staff, and teachers. Um, more than a thousand people, more than a thousand staff members were trained. And they were very open to, uh, to using the model and, and, and welcoming students in that way. So, so I think if you were to go into any of our schools, you would see the restorative practice at a tier one level being used regularly. Great, thank you very much for that assurance. You're welcome. Other questions? Any other questions? I have one question. Um, Ms. Robinson, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I had my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, didn't see I was just waiting to see if Ms. LaPierre or Ms. Oh, uh, yeah. had questions okay. before I raised my hand. Um, I'll just quickly say thank you for this presentation. 
And I appreciate that this is always on the table and constantly looking to refine. I think it's been a pride of the district the past few years, the approach we have been taking on code of conduct, um, the suspension rates, the, the, the drop on that, the focus on restorative justice. I will also say though, that part of the pride in that process has been the work of both COCAC and um, the Boston Student Advisory Council. And they have always been instrumental partners in refining this uh, proposal and presenting on the proposal. Um, I think of the work that BSAC did around the uh, app um, and that they pushed it to all students so that students could very quickly understand their rights. I think that was quite frankly national work that BSAC did on that um, issue. And it was a little bit of a surprise tonight to see both the chair of or co-chair of COCAC um, speaking to in public comment, not speaking as part of this presentation yeah. about concerns that they have about the revisions and, and to hear um, as part of the presentation that the concerns may be more of a philosophical issue as opposed to uh, a specific issues and so I do know that the co-chair, Ms. Ray's, uh, Professor Ray's, uh, Amaze Rothstein, did uh, send a letter to Ms. Sullivan and she forwarded to all members. So I look forward to reading it in detail after tonight to understand the concerns raised by COCAC in, in particular, uh, because they have been a very valued partner um, in, in the origination of this policy and the refinement of this policy. And I want to do my own thought process on were those concerns raised to us this evening philosophical um, or were they more substantive? And so I look forward to digging into that in a, in a bit more detail because the involvement of COCAC and BSAC and Ms. Mercer, your questions tonight as, as uh, Ms. LG pointed out were outstanding and exactly the type of feedback that is critical because this impacts all of our students. And so um, I, I just want to make sure that we're not deviating from what has been such a successful formula in this uh, policy. And that is the involvement of those two groups. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. I want to just, uh, just state to you that we are committed um, to working with both BSAC, um, as we have been, and with COCAC. Um, we met with them recently, just in terms of, you know, where do we go from here and making sure that we're continuing the dialogue. Um, so we will continue to do that. Um, we're committed to it. And if I can add to that, Ms. O'Neill, um, as you recall in the past, when we've um, gotten to some philosophical differences or differences in general, uh, the school committee members um, at the time and in different um, iterations did kind of step in and help us look at kind of what the differences were and and reviewed what those were and, and helped us push to some um, more consensus um, beyond what we were able to do alone. So we welcome that opportunity for members to, to join us in those conversations and have a different um, set of eyes on the work and, and, and advise us going forward. Um, and I also would, would just add that, you know, above and beyond COCAC and BSAC, we do have the end users in mind that we frequently engage with as well. And that's, a, that's also a heavy part of, of the feedback that we received. So it's a combination of balancing the feedback from COCAC, BSAC, but also the teachers, administrators, and staff at the school level and parents' voice as well that we try to balance all. So again, appreciate you looking into it um, more closely and um, welcome the opportunity for you and or others um, to, to help us reach more consensus with some of these stakeholders. Mr. O'Neill, I just wanted to mention and committee members that <clears throat> when I read the policy for the first time and then the revisions, it is the most progressive policy that um, I have ever worked uh, with and um, have seen without a lot of rancor from the other side of where people believe you should be more stern on discipline. Um, I've just been amazed by the progressive nature of the community to think very differently about student discipline. Um, when I was in Memphis, as you know, with Dr. Carol Johnson, who you love, um, we led up and she put me in charge of ending corporal punishment. Uh, and that's where we were. Um, and so this is a very progressive policy um, 
that restricts suspension, that requires a lot of process for students, that respects restorative justice and allows students to make um, things right if there were some um, um, ways in which you know they um, got sideways with the community. So I appreciate the, the work that the team has done to involve all parties, but also appreciate um, the push from our stakeholders to continue to look at it and ensure that it's culturally relevant um, and that we take this anti-racist lens. And so that's why I appreciate that the school committee looks at a policy, deliberates um, and listens more to the community. And if there are changes that we need to make um, over the next couple of weeks to bring um, any kind of amendments, we'll do that. Thank you, Superintendent, and appreciation for the whole team for working on this. Um, this is an important policy for us, for our students, impacts our students, and can really change, you know, a, a mistake in a class can make a difference in a student's life. And uh, the restorative justice practices have been working well, and the more we can focus on that for our students, the better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just have a question for clarification. Is the code of con conduct used across all grade levels or is it more focused at the high school levels? It's used across all grade levels. Um, as you know, with the adoption of this particular code, um, as it related to the settlement agreement in terms of suspensions, um, there are no suspensions for kindergarten through second grade and for third through fifth grade, um, there's only five particular reasons why a student could be subject to, um, to suspensions. So, but in terms of applying the whole code and in terms of prevention and promotion and all of, all of those things, um, tiered intervention, it's applied from K through 12. Right. Do we track over time, um, particularly I'm thinking about kids who may have some issues in the younger grades of what interventions we're using so that those problems do not continue with them throughout their their years so that they're not, a, you know, they're not having issues in the third grade and are still having significant behavioral, um, you know, conduct issues, you know, at the 10th or 11th grade. What kind of strategies are we using to both support teachers, families, and the student so that we are eliminating those issues as kids grow older? Thank you for the question. Um, we use uh, the, uh, Aspen, um, the student information systems to um, document um, behaviors and document interventions. One of the things um, specifically, you know, if a school leader is looking to do more, um, more progressive discipline or, you know, something restrictive, one of the questions that we're asking or, and we're looking for, what were the interventions tried? And so at times we're asking for documentation from that system related to that, to those, um, to those behaviors. So yes, we are, I, I don't wanna use the word tracking, but we're documenting um, so that we can support um, students. There's also other things, other tools um, that teachers will use in the classroom, a functional behavioral assessment that will track behaviors for the, for the, for the purpose of adjusting and tweaking and figuring out what the student's triggers are and to, to making sure that, you know, that we're helping the student um, you know, to be in the classroom and we're figuring out what the student needs. Um, so there's different tools, but yes, we are documenting. Thank you. And are, are we able to see where we are preventing longer term issues for students? I'm gonna have to think on that, to think about how, um, you know, we use Aspen to do that. And if we have data to certainly say that that is the case. So I'd have to think on that. And, and, and report back to the committee on, on that. All right, thank you so much. Um, before we move on, any last questions by any members? Yes, Ms. LaPera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you uh, team for this uh, presentation. Um, I do have one question. We're talking about documenting um, perhaps uh, trends within specific students or subgroups. Uh, to see what additional support students may need. Um, and I also heard mention around professional development for teach teachers. I'm wondering if we're doing the same for the educators. 
um, yes. and for the school leaders around um, documenting any patterns um, and or challenges, consistent challenges or increased number of suspensions by um, specific teachers to see what additional supports those teachers may need um, to be able to support their students adequately. So just curious to learn a little bit more about that. I thank you for the question. Um, so one of the ways that we look at that is um, we have data um, that comes out of Aspen that can be drilled down into where the suspensions are coming from in the school, you know, in terms of the classrooms, how many times a, a particular student has been um, suspended. One of the trainings um, that the operational leader provides, so the operational leaders have access and um, would have um, monthly uh, suspension uh, data dives to look at what are the, the schools that are being flagged with high suspension rates and they meet with the school leader and the school leader in turn is supposed to meet with the staff so that they can, they can identify um, some of those supports that maybe the classroom teacher would need. Um, this is, but all of this really feel like, feels like it's focusing to tier one, right? So what we're realizing is that in order for this to get better, we have to provide the classroom teachers with more tier one supports. Um, and that's why we're focusing on the MTSS in tier one. So yes, we do have that data. Yes, we do look at it to inform the support that we're giving to school leaders that they will give to their teachers. And the only thing I would add to that, um, Mr. Fair, is that Massachusetts 222 requires us to document any progressive discipline that we try. Um, and we have to try those before any exclusion occurs. So part of the documentation of these um, initiatives and or incidents is also tied to law. And the law also requires us monthly to review it and share it with school leaders and have those discussions. So that's part of the reason why we do it as well. Not only because it's a good practice, um, it's because uh, it, it's just a, a good practice to do in the schools um, as well. And the, and the schools appreciate that because we bring data to them and they have access to it and we spend time reviewing it with them. And we, and we looked at how to improve the school climate as a result of doing some of that work as well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I think the, the we're looking at data and we're seeing how it um, impacts different uh, subgroups. And so I think at a future date, it would be interesting to see um, what the correlation is between also the educator demographics um, and how that impacts our students. So for future discussion, but something that I'm thinking about. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? If not, thank you all for your work and we look forward to talking more with you at a later date. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next report is the Library Services Strategic Plan. At this time, I'd like to invite Deb Froggett, um, Director of Library Services, to please present her report. First, I'd like to invite the superintendent to provide opening remarks. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to thank um, Ms. Froggett for her work um, and work with our state librarians and our librarians across the district and city um, to bring rich enriching uh, opportunities and uh, texts and books to spark our imagination and inspire children and educators alike um, in school libraries. And we are excited about this five-year vision to increase school libraries in every single Boston public schools um, unless you're like right next to a BPL library. Um, so I'm uh, very excited to have you hear her presentation today. And, um, and then as we start talking about ESSER $3 and our operational budget, uh, you will hear uh, additional investments that we will be making around libraries. So Deb. Thank you, Dr. Caselius. Um, and thank you for this opportunity my, my colleague, Christine Landry, will be sharing the, the presentation. Um, this is the beginning of my seventh year serving as Director of Library Services. And prior to this, for nine years, I was the Library Director for the Boston Arts Academy Fenway High School Library. I'm thrilled to be here tonight to discuss the considerable investments that are being made in our school libraries 
through the, through the district and ESSER and the collaborative plan that we have developed to ensure that all students in Boston have consistent access to a school library or a BPL library by 2026. Next slide, please. This is a story about investing roughly $12 million to ensure that all BPS students have access to a school-based library or a high quality library or high quality library services. Across the Commonwealth, libraries are transforming lives. We know that school libraries transform lives. Like Dr. Caselius has said, we believe that all students should have consistent access to a library and a certified li librarian. State, federal and local funding of roughly $12 million over the next four years will make this possible. This investment includes updated high quality library collections, the addition of 80 licensed librarians and needed capital project, co projects. This investment is directly supporting the new equitable literacy district, district wide focus. The strategic plan I will present serves as a guidepost and a foundation for library services to grow. I also use the plan to set my annual performance evaluation goals. The Mass Board of Library Commissioners reviews, approves, and supports the, plan, the strategic plans of all Massachusetts libraries. This includes awarding and managing Library Services and Technology Act grants in order to receive LSTA funding. Oh, in order to receive LSTA funding, a library or district library program within the Commonwealth must have a strategic plan, or in the case of BPS, a district-wide plan. Thank you, next slide. These key meetings and tools enable the development and completion of the plan. A handful of BPS library team members began consulting for, libraries, for the Library Services City Council presentation in November, 2019. In December, 25 members of the library team used the racial equity tool to analyze and brainstorm, stra brainstorm strategies to implement basic school library program elements, equitable library access across the district and within schools, safe and accessible school library spaces, and literacy and access to print and digital resources. Together, we constructed a vision for what school libraries must provide for our students with the highest needs. This became the basis for our ESSER proposals. The plans consulting group includes a diverse set of teachers, principals, community partners, and school librarians. Along with the librarians and using a consensus model over the course of five months, the plans vision, mission, and theory of action and anchor goals were generated. The plan was completed in June and recent amendments to the plan include ESSER three initiatives. Thank you. While we have seen an overall decline in the number of open libraries and full-time librarians due to previous budget cuts, we are committed to changing this trajectory. During the 2016 to 21 plan, I've participated in 27 consultancies for either renewing or creating a new library, including two makeovers funded by Heart of America at Holmes and Dever Elementary Schools. A third at the PA Shaw Elementary was temporarily put on hold due to the pandemic. The Boston Foundation awarded library improvement grants in 2017 to Henderson Upper and the O'Brien School of Math and Science for technology and collection upgrades. These renewals will serve as a blueprint for moving forward. Eight teachers and paraprofessionals have achieved their school library certification and four are currently pursuing this credential. I serve as a, me as a mentor for these new roles and as a liaison with a certifying institution. In partnership with the Recruitment, Cultivation and Diversity Team at OHC, we are building out university partnerships to recruit and onboard a diverse set of preliminary licensed librarians. Thank you. As we expand library access, we will build on current programming and partnerships. 
We continue to have a strong collaboration with Boston Public Library that includes the most recent initiative where all students begin school with a Boston Public Library card. We hosted two literacy summits. We work closely with Youth Services Department in order to collaboratively construct summer reading lists and shared programming. We also work with a partner called Wondermore, a nonprofit that brings a diverse set of children's and young adult authors to schools. Students have the opportunity to see themselves when experiencing the literature and artwork of culturally and linguistically sustaining texts. Wondermore provides each student who engages in an author visit with a featured book. Since 2015, 40 BPS schools have hosted 110 author visits. Automation is technical and detailed. 25 libraries are members of the Metro Boston Library Network and integrate access with um, collection access with Boston Public Library. Interlibrary loan is reserved for schools with certified librarians. In 2015, there were 14 libraries that used Library World, an integrated library system in the cloud. Today, there are 26. Professional learning opportunities continue to grow and Zoom has strengthened the library team, allowing for higher participation. For instance, this past year, there were a total of 42 PD sessions with an attendance of 336. These programs included library aid basics for paraprofessionals, library teacher performance evaluation and the new American Association of School Library Standards, contemporary book discussions and biweekly library team Zooms. I highlight the guided inquiry design professional development. Dr. Leslie Maniotis, one of the researchers who developed this inquiry-based learning model, um, has worked with library teacher and teacher teams from 15 schools. ESSER One funds will enlist Dr. Maniotis to support the 712 school implementation, mass core student research skills, and certified librarians performance evaluations. Thank you. This is the plan's vision statement. Boston Public Schools Library Program will provide all BPS students and school community members with physical and intellectual access to library materials, services, and space that nurture academic, social, professional, and personal growth by 2026. The plan's mission offers more specific objectives, including collaborative teaching and learning that integrate college career and life ready skills with classroom content, which teach students to be responsible and ethical consumers and producers of information and creative works and provide transformative library spaces that enable changing models of learning. The theory of action states that if we offer all students equitable access to effective school library programs, then Boston Public Schools library services will become a significant element of a high performing nation leading district that closes gaps and improves the life outcomes for all students. Thank you. This section of the plan outlines relevant library services anchor goals that directly align to the current BPS strategic plan's six key commitments and anchor goals. They also align with the Office of Opportunity Gap goals. For example, the goals and key commitment one, eliminate opportunity and achievement gap, gaps are priority goals and they, address the, and they are addressed by the um, ESSER supports described in the next slide. These goals also reflect what it means for all students to have equi equitable access to an effective school library program from certified librarians to culturally responsive physical and digital collections and to an immersion in inquiry-based learning. Here's a list of ESSA return and recover supports that when introduced and facilitated will allow for the 22 through 26 BPS Library Services strategic plan to reach its vision. We have a team ready to implement the anchor goals and I look forward to returning to you to provide annual updates to the library services program and equitable student access to it. 
We look forward to the plan's approval and are ready to answer any questions. Thank you for this time and consideration. Thank you for your report. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Mr. De Arugio. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, th thank you, uh, Ms. Froberg, for the, uh, the presentation. Um, just enrolled my daughter uh, at the Bradley School where I went to uh, elementary school. And uh, when I was there, um, I had a librarian uh, who, was, who, who passed too early, uh, but she was a very important part of my life, uh, especially focused on literacy. So I'm, I'm happy to see many elements of this. Um, I, I do have some questions and actually, you know, kind of thinking about the Bradley as to, and I don't know why exactly why they no longer have a librarian or maybe staffing, but I, I think part of it for some schools might be space. So I wanted to hear if you could talk about that. Um, I've, I've seen some schools focus on building um, uh, collections within their classrooms. Um, and, uh, and then I think some are using the rest of funds to have um, you know, updated collections and, uh, and also having um, uh, ones that are reflective of, the, uh, of our, our student bodies as well. Um, so maybe just you know, that question there, of how, how, we how are we thinking about space? Um, and then also um, in, in this plan, you know, we're, setting, we're setting these goals um, how are we empowering um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the educators, uh, the staff on the ground uh, to best kind of meet the needs of their particular kids, their particular uh, population? Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there and I have one more question after that. So. Okay, so I hope I remember all these, these questions. Um, the, school leaders have to make some pretty hard choices when it comes to deciding whether or not they can have a library and um, mm -hmm. Some of them are space issues like you referenced um, and such. Um, in regards to classroom collections, we are growing those, but a classroom collection may not meet the needs of all of the, the students in regards to developing their love of literacy. You know, yes, it has the curricular needs. Um, I've done in my own research, um, the longer a teacher um, is in a school, the, the larger his or her um, classroom collection can be. So, mm -hmm. and I, I, I also just wanna add that a, a school library for a child is a tangible representation of knowledge and that students don't know what they don't know. And so he or she may find themselves wandering the the dinosaur section and then discover oh, Komodo dragons. They're a modern day dinosaur. So we, to, 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 to evoke this curiosity um, within its students. And then in regards to the, a plan for um, onboarding faculties to having a school librarian, um, I, we, I'm working with um, a set of, of, of my seasoned librarians to create an onboarding plan for these, for the new librarians in order to work with um, their faculties so that they bec become an active um, participant in the faculty and decision-making about the curriculum within the school, as well as working with the school leaders so that the, the um, certified librarians are, are, are really in a leadership role within the school. Mm -hmm. Thank you on that. Just one, one final question. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the context you know, of, of Esser, um, you know, part of this is you, you, you buy the books once and you kind of keep refreshing the population, but in terms of the staffing, are, are we worried about uh, what, what happens post, you know, when, when the Esser funds are, are used up? Um, uh, are we gonna have a commitment to, to keep those staffing levels or is this kind of cycling in for three to four years and then see where we are or, um, I mean, a question for the superintendent or. Yeah, so um, very good question. So this is like one of the examples that I use when I'm trying to describe sustainability um, with ESSER funding and also describe how it marries to the uh, operational budget. And so this is where we can um, update all the collections now with ESSER funding and buy the collections that are needed. We can update the spaces uh, with the ESSER funding and the shelving that's needed and the printers and different media technologies. 
And then with the staffing, we actually put that in our operational budget for FY22. Thank you. Ms. Mercer. Um, so I have more of a comment than a question. I kind of wrote it out, so I'm just gonna read it off. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to say to BPS, um, thank you for investing into students' literary skills. It is very important for students to start reading and writing at young ages and the resources and support when going through that rough journey of understanding the weirdness of the English language. I was one of the students that struggled with reading in the beginning and was lucky enough to have a school with a nice size library and literary support systems to get me to the same level as my fellow peers. Without that, I don't think that I would have developed my love for Greek mythology and reading other <laughs> Percy Jackson books in the library that I could find. My love of how complex history can be along with being able to even take AP Lit last year and AP Lang this year. So thank you on the behalf of all students and the teachers and educators that are also benefiting from this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mercer. Thank you. Ms. LaPera. That was a kind of a drop the mic moment. <laughs> yes, that was wonderful. A hard act to follow, Ms. Mercer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't have mine written out and it won't be anywhere near as eloquent, <laughs> <Wrong point. laughs> um, but I will give it a shot. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. Um, as a parent in the system, I really do appreciate just having access to, um, I mean, in Boston, the libraries and for the schools that do have um, their own libraries or just access to books. My daughter earlier today was trying to convince me to take her to the Boston Public Library. She's three. I said, I'm sorry, I have to work, <laughs> but just the love of reading is already being um, cultivated. Uh, I think one of the pieces that, um, two points, I'll keep it brief. One piece is um, I'm raising my children bilingually and we have a significant number of our students in Boston Public Schools um, that speak more than one language. Uh, and so it is incredibly difficult um, as a parent who is well-resourced and who is educated to find, um, to find literature in native language um, that is accessible and that is affordable. Um, and so I, I just, I want to uh, reemphasize the need for continuing to find diverse um, books that are available that are reflective of our community, um, because I think that that's incredibly important for our children's identity as well as their academic development. Um, and then the other piece that I wanted to um, kind of get more clarity around is Mr. DeRujo uh, mentioned it a little bit. Um, facilities are a challenge. I know even within COVID at my son's school, what used to be the library has been transformed more permanently into a classroom because of the need for larger space. Um, and so I wonder um, how we're thinking of working with school leaders uh, to think about prioritizing um, libraries, uh, but knowing that that's also a choice. And so I'm trying to reconcile, like, is this, is this decision being made in conjunction with school leaders how are we deciding what school communities to prioritize? Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to understand what that process looks like. Well, as you know, we do have autonomous schools, but what we are working toward and what I want to propose to the school committee is that there are essential basic services for an excellent education and an equitable education. You just heard Ms. Mercer talk about her love of learning and how it inspired her to take rigorous coursework and not having that at a school, I don't think is optional. <laughs> and so I think we should really think about what is the quality guarantee that we wanna have at every school regardless, um, and then work with school leaders on identifying space. I, don't, I can't think of one school leader that would say that they don't wanna have a school library. 
So I think it would be about looking at spaces and um, usage of space as we think about our build PPS projects and how we can expand that and make it available. I appreciate that, um, Superintendent. I think I think that I would agree with you that I that there's probably not a leader that would would say that they don't want a library, but I think right now there are limited options on how to make all these pieces happen. At my own son's school, before COVID, before it was being used as a classroom because of COVID, the library was also being used as the science lab or the science room. And so I think that there are some real, real life um, restrictions that we do need to think creatively about. And as um, Mr. Cooter had mentioned earlier in thinking of how do we streamline our investments to make sure that it's moving towards all, you know, the same area? We need to be thinking about that with our facilities. Um, because if the choices of STEM lab and a library, our, our children are just missing out, right? So we have to figure out how to make that work. And you shouldn't have to make a choice. Suburban, kids, suburban kids have those all the time. <laughs> so, so let's um, figure out how to make that happen. So the, the bigger work is, you know, working with our next mayor around the capital improvements and expansions that we need. Um, and it's going to cost the city billions of dollars <laughs> if we're going to give kids the buildings that they deserve. Um, and I'm a champion for that and have been since, we, since I got here. We're right now fixing the basics but now that we've got we're you know got the funding for clean water, we've got the funding for the air, um, you know it, and we've gotten our buildings clean, and we've got additional custodians built into the operational budget, and we've fixed windows. You know we need to fix the remainder of the windows, but we also need to ensure that um, we have gymnasiums and cafeterias that are adequate, and we have libraries and science labs. So um, that's part of this overall vision of a quality experience and guarantee for every single student. Um, and so we'll have to bring that forward then uh, with the Build PPS. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. I just want to uh, build on my colleagues comments about the trade-off and, and the list that you had superintendent I'd also add art rooms right for art and music etc in our schools and these are difficult choices that school leaders have had to make the past couple of years in tough budget times I mean we hate when we hear that they're cutting libraries that they're cutting arts etc now they've been many of them have been able to build back and it has not been the budget issues um, it has been the the physical restraints that they just don't have the room to put it. Um, so you see schools where the, the music class is now on the auditorium stage as an example. Um, and as Ms. LaPera pointed out as well about, you know, with COVID, you see school nurses needing more space because of testing, professional development, you name it, where schools are, are multi-sourcing uh, the rooms and so, this will be a challenge. I echo Mr. D'Arujo's comments about the, as much as I support all of this, the, the potential for fiscal cliffs. So I appreciate you put it into the operating budget. I also think it, it calls into question, I have been a huge proponent of weighted student funding formula and continue to be, but of something the chair has brought up the past few years of what is foundational for a school budget. And if we are deeming it foundational and it could be a school leader and a, a assistant principal and a school secretary and things like that, you know, what are we funding from the central budget and not putting um, uh, our school leaders where they have to make uh, very difficult decisions about an art teacher versus a librarian versus a family liaison versus a social worker, as an example, some of the things that we have been adding the past couple of years. So um, how we approach our foundational budgets for schools in the future, while still being true to weighted student funding formula, um, but, but particularly as 
uh, enrollments vary for schools. Yep, that is what we are talking about in the reimagine of BPS and the quality guarantee. So when I talk about what's the quality guarantee, that is synonymous with what you've said about a foundational budget. Yep. But I also echo it the is about equity. Go ahead. And, and it is about equity, you're right. And I also echo the importance of this, particularly as you look to put in higher standards across the districts, Mass right. Corps being an example. Right. It's important for us if we talk about raising our standards and want to improve the opportunities for all of our students, then doing steps like this are critical. This is how we walk the walk to get to the talk of higher standards and higher achievement. I'm so excited to hear everybody's support for libraries. Oh, absolutely. Any other comments? Um, I, I can only say how thrilled I am with this plan. Um, you know, I was a BPS student in a school that did not have a library. I went to the Nathan Hale, but what we did have was the bookmobile. No, and my question is for those schools that may not have a library, has there been any consideration of recreating a bookmobile type program that could bring a library? Or there could be an art mobile that could bring an art classroom to supplement the places that we don't have facilities. Um, years ago, the Nathan Hale turned what had been the coal storage room. This was a school built in 1909 and they got a coal delivery. And when we stopped having the coal delivered, they were able to turn that space into a library. But then a couple of years ago when they added a sixth grade, they had to move the principal's office and put her in the cold room and then they did not have a library. But then this past spring, we were, we were able to be at the Nathan Hale when it dedicated its new library in what had been a third grade classroom. I mean, so that's a community that was dedicated to try to make a library happen. Um, and I know given as Ms. LaPere and others have said, the, the space issues that schools are facing, trying to create and add space for social workers and everyone else um, in a building that can't expand, are there some other creative ways? I mean, I'd hate to be the schools that have to wait five years in this plan to be front and center. So are there ways that, you know, again, through maybe it is classroom libraries and relationships with Boston Public School, Boston Public Library branches. But is there a way that even though it may be five years that we could have a statement and a plan about what's happening now? Because I'd hate to be that child that's entering kindergarten in a school that won't see a library, pro, a significant library plan until I'm literally in the fifth grade. Um, yeah, I can I can jump in with that, and I'm sure my colleagues have more to say. Um, thank you, Chair, for that that wonderful question. And I think, again, our, our priority here is to um, continue to build those relationships with the BPL, who have been such an amazing partner to us, and sort of beyond library cards, which is critical that everyone have them, um, and beyond checking out books every week or every other week but also really embedding the learning that's happening in, in classrooms and the equitable literacy work that we're doing and the research that um, Dr. Froggett talked about um, through guided inquiry into the libraries too. And our, our um, youth and, and children's librarians have been fabulous partners and are going to continue to be. So our, our first sort of our triage there, which you know, I find is a, it's a bright spot, right? Other, unlike other um, spaces where like arts or other places where there's not a, um, an immediate corollary. Right here, there is in our neighborhoods um, that can really be a support and act as that school library in a sense for, um, for our schools while we do the capital work necessary or, or make the changes um, that are needed for schools to have that library in, in their building. But we have talked about the buses, and I know um, Dr. Caselius, I, I believe, experienced this in Minnesota. It was something we've talked about, um, sort of bringing back that idea of the a bookmobile, and it's it's certainly 
something we will continue to explore. Great, thank you. So if there are no further questions, thank you so much for your presentation and we look forward to hearing your updates. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to public comment on reports. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers or public comment on reports. Is there any new business? Mr. De Arugio. Madam Chair and colleagues, I'd like to recommend that uh, we've talked at the last meeting uh, about access to, um, uh, to native language um, and uh, the policy kind of rationale behind that, that we, that we, we put that um, you know, uh, for discussion uh, that we adopt either we can you know, focus narrowly on that um, uh, issue, uh, but adopt that as a policy uh, for our school system. Um, I you know, strongly believe, I know some of my colleagues have reflected this before, um, that you know, kind of the, the, the research is showing that the importance of having uh, of, uh, having native instruction in in increasing achievement um, for our kids that uh, don't have English as their, their their first language, the benefits of preserving their uh, their native language, um, and also just you know a few years past years notwithstanding, uh, Boston uh, has always been a home uh, welcoming immigrants you know across the world. And, uh, and having a, a, the public education system of Boston being able to integrate uh, uh, these kids into, uh, you know, uh, America's fabric and, um, and celebrate, you know, celebrate them. Um, I think that's really critical. And I'd love to see that um, soon, as, as soon as we can, to, mm -hmm. to have that discussion and get that, um, get that policy uh, uh, going uh, 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 for us to review. Great. It's a great idea. Thank you. It is part of our ELL um, plan forward. Uh, we're just finalizing some of our um, vetting of that with our stakeholders and getting that correct. And I know uh, Dr. Eccleson is working uh, on that with his team. Thank you. Looking forward to that. We will be presenting that, I, I believe, in October when we bring the academic vision forward. Great. That concludes our business for this evening. Um, the next school committee meeting will take place on Wednesday, October 6th. On that date, we are planning for a return to an in-person hybrid meeting that will allow the public to continue to participate remotely. We'll share more details on the committee's webpage. And I believe we're gonna go back to a 6 p.m. start at that meeting because now with people working, um, it gives our members time to get from their day jobs to the bowling building. Um, so we will be moving that meeting until six. Um, the committee will be having a training session this Saturday with the Mass Association of School Committees, which is the organization that trains new school committee members. Um, given the fact that Many of us have never met in person. Our whole committee will be coming together for that training. Um, and then on, uh, in, an, in October, the evenings of October 12th and 13th, the committee is planning a retreat that will allow us to regroup and thoughtfully plan for the school year ahead. And more information will be posted on the committee's webpage as that date gets closer. If there's nothing th further, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, uh, a point of clarification. So if we're gonna go to a hybrid meeting um, so that people can participate by Zoom uh, and starting six o'clock, are we going to find a way to um, manage the volume of and get our business done? That is a good question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. obviously concerned that we start at five, we spend two hours or more in public time, which I, public I other, and then it's going to be, now it's going to be eight, nine o'clock before we start. Some of us have to be going home. Um, it feels, I worry about our productivity if we don't find some way to um, integrate that in a way that doesn't become brutal, frankly. Agreed. Agreed. 
Well, one of the things that we can have discussed in our training on Saturday with the um, Mass, Mass Association of School Committees is how other districts have managed um, public comment. And maybe there will be a way that we can come up with a plan with regard to that. Thank I know you. That, that that has been a concern. Um, we've looked at past pro, um, policies and at one time public comment was 20 minutes at the beginning and then it was an hour. And then now for the, as far as, as long as I've been on the committee, it's been as long as it's needed to be. So I'm not quite sure what are, what policies um, legally that we can do to manage the amount of time that is allowed for public comment, but it'll be good for us to be able to understand what other um, school committees in the Commonwealth are doing and also we can ask on our weekly meetings with the Council of Great City Schools for other um, ideas that others are using and maybe be able to bring it back to our public so that they can help us to manage this. Um, the, the idea that people that we are starting very early, um, you know, with a, a full day meeting, a full meeting after many members now have been having done a full day work and getting our the the meat of our meeting started at eight or nine o'clock is really hard for everyone. So hopefully we can work together with our public to come up with a reasonable set of expectations. Thank you. Thank thank you for considering. Yeah, thank you. And I do move a foreclosure for tonight. All right. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, is there any discussion or objection to the motion? None. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Coleman? Yes, and have a great evening, everyone. Mr. De Rujo? Yes, thank you. Ms. Lopera? Yes, buenas noches. Ms. Blanco Garcia? Yes, good day. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes, uh, thank you, and good evening. Ms. Robinson? Thank you, yes. Unanimous, thank you. Thank you, good night. And look forward to seeing you all on Saturday. <laughs>